It all comes down to this. In an election year like no other, voting numbers here in North Carolina and across the nation shatter records as people ensure their voices are heard. We want to get back to living normal. Very important for people to get out and vote. This is what democracy looks like. From the State House to the White House, we're following all the major races. Here in Alamance County, six candidates battle for three commissioner seats. Plus, how control for North Carolina's House and Senate districts may be determined through races here in the county. Statewide, it's the race between incumbent Democrat Roy Cooper and Republican Dan Forrest in the race for governor. And the balance of power in the U.S. Senate could come down between incumbent Republican Tom Tillis and Democrat Cal Cunningham. And in the race for the White House, all eyes are on North Carolina and its 15 electoral votes, as they may be just enough to push Donald Trump or Joe Biden over the 270 mark to win the presidency. We need a president who's going to bring us together, not pull us apart. And I have fought for you harder than any president has ever fought. Tonight, our Maeve Ashbrook is following races in North Carolina, with Baylor Rodman breaking down the national contests and our team in the newsroom and across Alamance County bringing you the latest information. As the country awaits its next direction, it's election night in America. Most polls are closed here in North Carolina and votes are being counted. Welcome to Elon News Network's special coverage of the 2020 election. I'm Brian Ray. Thank you for joining us. The North Carolina Board of Elections extended voting in four polling precincts due to delays. This means the board will not release any statewide results until 8.15 tonight. But the Associated Press is projecting that uh, President Trump will win South Carolina. We're now going to check in with Baylor Rodman, who's following the presidential race. Baylor, what other results do we have so far tonight? Yes, thank you so much. Good evening, Brian. Again, I'm Baylor Rodman. I'll be covering the presidential race across all 50 states throughout the evening. And as you said, President Trump has taken the state of South Carolina back to his uh, electoral vote count. We're currently at 22 Trump, 16 Biden, although uh, it's just been at the top of the hour. So within a few moments, I'm sure we'll have a lot of extra races to call for you as well. Uh, but we can project that uh, Joe Biden will win the state of Virginia, um, which is a big one for sure and uh, Vermont, and also that we can project that President Trump will take uh, Kentucky as well as West Virginia. So currently we're following a lot of historical trends, um, but uh, nothing certainly out of the ordinary as well. And again, West Virginia for Trump there, Kentucky uh, for Trump as well. Let's head into North Carolina because we're starting to get a few results in there as well. Again, we just got about 1% of the results in, but Donald Trump up there about 68.6%. Again, we just have 1% of the vote in currently so far. So again, not a whole lot to really base this off of. But North Carolina could really come down to the wire. It is one of those states that, um, you know, with those 15 electoral votes, could put either candidate over the top by the end of the night. Uh, let's go now also to Florida as well as there's uh, some numbers I want to bring you there um, with those 29 electoral votes with about 78 percent reporting it's pretty neck and neck with Joe Biden at 49.9 percent of the vote and Donald Trump there with 49.2 we are being told too we're seeing in some uh, voter analysis trends that President Trump is outperforming with Hispanic and Cuban American voters uh, including in the state of Florida and across the country as well again we're getting the latest information in my ear as it comes in and we're currently with Joe Biden now with 85 electoral votes with President Trump's 55, so we're going to update our board and get back to you with all of the latest. It's a moving night, but it can take a while to get some of these results, so we'll be back and forth for sure. Brian, right now, back to you. Yeah, thanks, Baylor. We will check back in with you later tonight. We're also following news out of Grand this evening where the push to the polls march led by Reverend Gregory Drumwright, who was on our show last night, met counter-protesters earlier this evening. Our Isabella Seaman is over there right now. Isabella, how are things looking? Yeah, Brian, so today's pushed to the polls in Graham and did nothing like it did last Saturday. So if you're following our coverage on Saturday, there was a march to the polls led by Reverend Drumwright. That day, the, put, the march to the polls ended in a pepper fog. Now that pepper fog was made by the Graham Police Department and the Alamance County Sheriff's Department. Now the Graham Police Department said they sprayed it on the ground. However, Reverend Drumwright says that is not the case. Now today, Reverend Drumwright, along for justice for the next generation, wanted to do a push to the polls. Now in my hands, I'm holding the protocol for the push to the polls. They did things like stay on the sidewalk this time, unlike Saturday. Also, they did not chant at all. 
when they made it to two polling stations, there was over 400 people that walked to the polls. Now, when they made it to downtown Graham, they were met with about 50 counter protesters. Luckily, there was no physical interaction, just a little bit of verbal interaction. Reverend Drumright said some words and from there, everyone dispersed. So luckily today, there has been no physical altercation and everything has ended peacefully. I'll have more about this later in the show, so stay tuned. And back, Brian, back to you in the studio. Thanks, Isabella. We'll be following this story throughout the evening. And as of right now, more than 4 million ballots have been cast here in North Carolina. That is the pre-election day count. We're still waiting for the current numbers. We'll now hear more about the local races from Maeve Ashbrook. Maeve, what are you following tonight? Yeah, Brian, we're following lots of local races. And just to give a quick overview, one of those first ones, the Alamance County Commissioner, six candidates here, three spots, and it doesn't matter which party you are. The three candidates with the top three votes are going to get those three seats. We're also going to be looking at the North Carolina State House of Representatives, District 63 and District 64. Now, even though District, District 63, excuse me, does not include Elon University, it does include parts of the town of Elon and spans east into the rest of Alamance County. As far as District 64, that does include the university and goes west into Alamance County, you know, hidden places like Gibsonville. We're also going to be following North Carolina Carolina Senate District 24. That's Amy Gailey, who's currently the chair of the Alamance County Commissioners versus J.D. Wooten, who also ran for the seat in 2018 and lost a little more nationally. We're looking at the U.S. House of Representatives race for North Carolina and a U.S. Senate race. It's really going to be a big deal within the Senate and the balance of that. Now, with over 3.6 million early votes cast and over 900,000 mail-in ballots already received by the North Carolina State Board of Elections, these national races, I took a look at the state of those and how those are going to affect the state of North Carolina. All eyes are on North Carolina tonight as the state is both critical for President Donald Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden's path to 270 electoral votes. Recent polling has the real clear politics average with Biden just 0.3 percent ahead of Trump. President of Elon College Republicans Alexis Malagudi and President of Elon College Republicans Daniel Derosiak say the race is just too close to call. I've tried to hold back on like making concrete predictions just to like spare myself some maybe disappointment. I obviously want my candidate to win. Uh, you know, I think all of us who have individual political ideologies want their candidate to win, but um, I'm just excited to see what happens as a result of this. This isn't the first year North Carolina is a battleground state. Since 2008, the state has gone both blue and red, with candidates narrowly winning North Carolina's 15 electoral votes. Another important race to watch in North Carolina is the U.S. Senate race between incumbent Republican Tom Tillis and Democrat candidate Cal Cunningham. Real not the time to cast doubt on the most reputable organization in the world. No matter who wins, DeRosiak says he's excited to see where his party goes in the future. We're the next generation of Republican leadership. So we get to dictate how our party reacts to the Trump presidency, whether he loses in 2020 or if he gets a second term. But for Malagudi, she says she's hesitant to trust her party after the election, even if Biden wins. I think it will embolden the DNC to say, hey, look, we won this election without the progressive left or the radical left. You know, moving forward, we can continue to we can continue to run moderate candidates and win that way. Maeve Ashbrook, Elon Local News. And North Carolina Board of Elections say they expect to count 97% of the vote tonight. And we'll be right back. And welcome back. Today, Elon students could take a shuttle to the polls here in North Carolina. One of our reporters went along for the ride and met one student who is on the way to the poll to vote. I wanted to go through the Elon Votes program if possible, just because I've worked with them a lot already to try to figure out everything for voter registration in North Carolina. So I was sort of going through that whole process. Also, I wanted free transportation on election day. And that shuttle stopped at the First Baptist Church of Elon before dropping Taylor Dunphy off at his polling location, Elon Elementary. The shuttles were mostly empty as Elon votes encouraged students to vote early this year. We're now going to check in with our Margaret Faust, who's over at the Alamance County Board of Elections in Graham. Margaret, how are things looking over there? Hi, Brian. Nothing really is going on here yet. 
Um, we haven't had seen any cars drive through uh, turning in their results from their precinct. Uh, there are four law enforcement officers here behind me. We spoke to a representative from the Board of, uh, the Board of Elections who said he is not worried about uh, any you know, violence or unrest uh, from the courthouse drifting over here to the, pre, uh, to the Board of Elections. He thinks uh, that, that him and, and all of his workers are going to be safe. So uh, there's not much to report here. Back to you, Brian. Thank you, Margaret. And we'll check back in with Margaret during our hour-long coverage starting right here at 9 p.m. And in response to election results, the Office of Student Life is offering post-election events for students. Starting tomorrow, November 4th, there will be panels and spaces open for reflection, as well as a health and wellness panel organized by Counseling Services. Elon Counselor Mark Eads told Elon News Network he's noticed both a lot of excitement and anxiety surrounding this election and hopes students utilize the resources available. And there were no classes today for Elon students. Our team spoke with students to see how they spent Election Day. I'm really trying to bury my head in the sand and not be anxious until we find out the results. And I did some work and now I'm going to go back to my dorm, maybe hammock and just relax and try not to stress about the election. I voted this morning um, at 6.30 a.m. I got online super early and I feel like I've already like lived a whole day of events so far so I've just been relaxing the rest of the day. Um, I early voted, I like mailed it in and um, nothing really, just is our day off to just try to relax before we find out what's happening. <laughs> and that's all for our update this hour. Make sure to tune back in with us at 9 p.m. as we continue to follow the results of the 2020 election. We'll see you then. Good evening and welcome to Elon News Network's special coverage of the 2020 election. I'm Brian Ray. The polls are now closed in North Carolina and we hope you'll stick with us. As the results come in throughout the night, we'll be updating you on the races both locally and nationally as those results come in. But now our Maeve Ashbrook is following the local races tonight. Maeve, what races are you following? Yeah, Brian, we have several local races to cover tonight, but just to give again a quick overview. First of all, the Alamance County Commissioner race, six candidates three spots and it does not matter which party the three with the most votes are those three will get those three spots with the most votes. We're also taking a look at the North Carolina House of Representatives District 63 and District 64. Now while District 63 does not include Elon University, it does include parts of the town of Elon and extends east into the rest of Alamance County and District 64. Like I said, does actually include the university and goes west into Alamance County towards Gibsonville. We're also looking at the North Carolina State Senate race for District 64. That's between the current chair of the Alamance County Commissioners, Amy Gailey and J.D. Wooten, who actually ran for this seat in 2018 and lost. We're also going we're also going to look at the Un United States House of Representatives a little more nationally and the United States Senate race. And excuse me, it is the North Carolina State Senate District. 24. Now with 3.6 million early votes already in and over 900,000 mail-in mail ballots collected by the North Carolina State Board of Elections, I took a look at the state of some of these national races and how they might affect North Carolina. All eyes are on North Carolina tonight as the state is both critical for President Donald Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden's path to 270 electoral votes. Recent polling has the real clear politics average, with Biden just 0.3% ahead of Trump. President of Elon College Republicans Alexis Malagudi and President of Elon College Republicans Daniel Derosiak say the race is just too close to call. I've tried to hold back on like making concrete predictions just to like spare myself some maybe disappointment. I obviously want my candidate to win. Uh, you know, I think all of us who have individual political ideologies want their candidate to win, but um, I'm just excited to see what happens as a result of this. This isn't the first year North Carolina is a battleground state. Since 2008, the state has gone both blue and red, with candidates narrowly winning North Carolina's 15 electoral votes. Another important race to watch in North Carolina is the U.S. Senate race between incumbent Republican Tom Tillis and Democrat candidate Cal Cunningham. Real not the time to cast doubt on the most reputable organization in the world. No matter who wins, DeRosiak says he's excited to see where his party goes in the future. We're the next generation 
coalition of Republican leadership. So we get to dictate how our party reacts to the Trump presidency, whether he loses in 2020 or if he gets a second term. But for Malagudi, she says she's hesitant to trust her party after the election, even if Biden wins. I think it will embolden the DNC to say, hey, look, we won this election without the progressive left or the radical left, you know, moving forward, we can continue to we can continue to run moderate candidates and win that way. Maeve Ashbrook, Elon Local News. And the North Carolina Board of Elections say they expect to be able to count 97% of the vote tonight. But maybe we'll check back in with you as those local results keep coming in. But now we're going to head over to Isabella Seaman, who's over in Graham. She's been following the push to the polls protest and has an update for us on a lawsuit filed. Isabella, what's new over there? And we apologize for those technical difficulties. We will check back in with Isabella in a few minutes. But right now, all eyes are on the race to the White House. Both Donald Trump and Democratic nominee Joe Biden are battling for those 270 electoral votes. We're going to head over to Baylor Rodman, who's following the presidential race. Baylor, what's new? Yeah, thanks so much, Brian. And wow, what an evening we have so far. Uh, for the race to 270, we got Joe Biden up at 119 to Trump 91. All things considered, we're pretty much following historical trends. So we haven't seen anything yet out of the ordinary um, that is raising any eyebrows. That being said, in a lot of the states that we haven't called, things are a lot closer um, than you might have expected in states like Texas and Georgia and so on and so forth. Let's check in really quickly, quickly excuse me, with Florida and it's 29 electoral votes. Currently President Trump is in the lead there with 51.2% of the vote with Joe Biden 47.9. Again, 29 electoral votes at stake. It's very hard for President Trump to get to 270 without winning the state of Florida. The campaign has said uh, and members and boots on the ground there have said that the president's really outperforming amongst uh, Latino and Cuban voters, not only in Florida, but throughout the country as well. So that's something that we're currently keeping our eyes on. I also want to go to Ohio for a second. This is really important too, um, with its 18 electoral votes, also really important for President Trump to have that chance at 270. Currently with just about 56% of the vote in, we got Joe Biden with 53.5, Donald Trump with 45.3. Today was the highest number of COVID cases that Ohio has seen thus far since the pandemic. And from voter analysis uh, polling there, um, Ohioans have said that COVID is their number one issue um, at the polls today. So um, potentially, maybe that's why we're seeing things the way we are right now. But again, just 56% of the vote in. Uh, and of course, we want to take a look at North Carolina. North Carolina with its 15 electoral votes. This is, of course, the Tar Heel state that we're in. And currently we got Joe Biden in the lead there with 51.5, Donald Trump 47.4. Yes, about 75% of the vote is in. But remember, uh, for those ballots that are postmarked by Election Day, they're going to be accepted until November 12th. So again, we may not be able to call this tonight. Currently, Cal Cunningham, the Democrat, is in the lead in that U.S. Senate race as well uh, over Tom Tillis, the Republican incumbent. So we're going to bring all the latest to you. But that's what I got for you right now. Brian back to you. And we're now going to check in with John Sarver. We apologize for those technical difficulties earlier, but again, he's stationed at a Democratic watch party over in Burlington, and he has an update for us over there. So, John, what, what are things looking like over there? Thank you, Brian. I am at the watch party for Democratic candidate of the 63rd District of the North Carolina House of Representatives, uh, Ricky Hurtado, who I happen to have with me right now. Thank you very much uh, for joining me, Mr. Hurtado. It's great to be here. Thank you. And I was wondering if you could just give me a, just a chance to reflect on your campaign and everything that's just kind of led up to uh, election night 2020. Yeah, well, this has been a, a long road to get here. We've been campaigning for over 15 months. We launched our campaign in July of 2015. Uh, and we're really proud of what we've done here in Alamance County. We focused on the issues that matter to families, especially in the midst of a pandemic. When we think about public health crisis and economic crisis, and really thinking about how we chart a new path forward and we think about equity and uh, how we bring our community together. And so those are the things we focus on, and I'm proud of what we've done so far here. And could you just give me, uh, being at this event here tonight, could you just give me a, a sense of what, what it's been like to interact with uh, the people here tonight and just what, what, what's sort of the sense that you're getting from everybody? Yeah, well, there's a lot of family, friends here, volunteers who have been to campaign since the beginning. And so people are feeling every emotion you can imagine. Uh, they are optimistic, they are nervous, they're anxious, they're excited. They believe in the vision that we painted for Alamance County, North Carolina, and they, they are 
keeping their fingers crossed that that's the vision that we get to propel forward over the next few years. And um, could you just give me a sense of just going forward, what are you uh, – with, with regards to Malcolm, what are you kind of hoping to see in Alamance County moving forward um, in terms uh, after election night 2020? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that what we heard in the community day in and day out when we talked to voters is that they're worried about how they're going to put food on the table. They're worried about how they're going to pay for their health care. They're worried about public schools for their children. And more than anything in Alamance County right now, we're in a moment of reckoning in terms of our racial inequities in our past and people want to figure out how we really bring our community together and really move forward as one and so when we think about the divide between our communities when we think about the challenges uh that people are having right now that's what people want to focus on and that's what i'm excited to push forward regardless of the outcome tonight awesome and thank you very much for taking the time to speak with me mr Hurtado. of course thanks uh Brian, back to you in the studio. Thank you, John. And we're now going to turn to two Elon students who are joining us tonight. They're the leaders of their respective political parties here on campus. We're joined by College Democrats President Alexis Malagudi and College Republicans President Daniel Jarosiak. Thank you both for joining us tonight. Um, so my first question is, you know, North Carolina has been established as a major swing state, you know, for either candidate to win 270 tonight. So why are North Carolina's electoral votes so important to this presidential race? So North Carolina, I guess I'll start. Um, Re Republicans in North Carolina really need to come out in more rural counties. And in order for President Trump to really win 270, North Carolina really needs to go for Donald Trump. Uh, a lot of analysts, and I personally agree as well, the, the path for President Trump to re-win election is extremely narrow and it has to come through North Carolina. Yeah, and Alexis, do you want to answer that question as well? Yeah, I think North Carolina is critical because it is a swing state. Um, in 2016, we saw North Carolina go red for um, Donald Trump, but blue for Roy Cooper. Um, and I think we really have the ability if people um, show up for Biden to turn the entire state blue. Yeah, so going off of that, you know, obviously there's a presidential election, but there's a lot of local races here in North Carolina, too. So why is it so important that students, you know, tune in and pay attention to the local politics as well as the national politics? It is. So for me, um, local races are ex more important, in, in my opinion, than the national race because they more so directly impact individuals' lives. Um, the local races that I've personally worked with, Amy Gailey, uh, you know, Steve Ross, uh, John Paisley for county commissioner, and a few other races, um, those are incredibly important because they not only dictate what Alamance County residents uh, have to go, like, have to live through with taxes, uh, with infrastructure, and with other, you know, the myriad of issues that has to have, that go on uh, that are on the ballot this election, but also it's what Elon students also go through. And so I think local, that students should also be really focused on local elections because it's going to determine what their school environment is during their course of their college career. Yeah, going off of that, um, I agree with Daniel that local elections are almost more important than um, voting in the national election just because they affect you like on a more on a ground level. I'm from North Carolina. I'm from Chapel Hill, which is a pretty blue area. So I actually changed my registration in the midterms to vote in Alamance County because I'm part of this community. I think a lot of times Elon students see themselves as being part of an Elon bubble, but there's a greater community that we're a part of and the legislation that happens in the community directly affects us. Yeah, and as leaders of both of your respective organizations, what did you do this election cycle to kind of help mobilize students in your organization, even outside of your organization, too? So Elon College Republicans really took this election cycle by the, by the throat and just absolutely went at it full throttle. Um, as of October 15th, we made over 300,000 voter contacts. And I think basically what got a lot of our students really motivated is fear of what would happen if we actually lose this election, which there is a potential that we will. Um, I'm not saying, you know, it's a, it's a toss-up state. Uh, we went out and we partnered with organizations uh, such as our State Federation of College Republicans we, with the NRA, and we really made sure that, you know, students recognized that every single voter contact they made 
um, was incredibly important and I think that hopefully it's going to have a really big impact. So College Democrats focused a lot on having conversations um, in the spring of um, 2020 before we went home we just voted as a club um, with who we wanted to endorse and we actually endorsed Bernie Sanders so Biden wasn't um, our first choice so we had a lot of critical conversations about where Biden has done wrong and then what Biden can do better and why people want to vote for him why people don't want to vote for him um, we we talked a lot about voting in general and uh, how we think that voting is effective or maybe not too effective, especially at the local and state level. And it was just a lot of critical conversations. And we had a lot of conversations about what it would look like if Biden were to lose and um, there was a Trump victory and just safety concerns after the convoy that happened. Um, so just a lot of conversation about how, how we move forward regardless of whether Biden wins or not. Yeah, well, thank you both for your time and for your insight. We will check back in with you later tonight. According to data from Tufts University, North Carolina has seen a 9% increase in voter registrations in people ages 18 to 24. Director of the Elon Poll, Jason Hosser, says youth voters tend to turn out in higher numbers when elections seem competitive and high stakes, like this 2020 election. Students realize that either person could win, their vote matters, their, this election is very much up for grabs by either candidate, and the stakes are very here at Elon University, only 44% of eligible students voted in the 2016 election. According to Elon Votes, a nonpartisan initiative to help students navigate voting, they've seen an increase in students registering to vote, with many asking how to change their registration to North Carolina. Tommy Truitt was one of those students. Maryland uh, tends to go pretty solidly blue every year, so I knew that North Carolina was um, a more important state to cast my vote in, like my vote would count more here. Elon Vote says nearly 32% of Elon students registered for the first time this election cycle, and they expect to have student turnout data in 28, excuse me, March 2021. And we're now going to check in with Baylor Rodman, who's following that presidential election for us. Baylor, any update? Yeah, good evening, Brian. Thank you so much. We were able to call uh, New York since the last time I saw you for uh, Joe Biden as well. An interesting thing there is that New York ballots are only counting in person today, not mail-in. Um, obviously, uh, traditionally Democratic states, we were still able to call that, but there should be some more votes coming in uh, as well. Also, polls are closing right now in Wisconsin, but the governor has said that he expects to know the results uh, tonight or tomorrow, as Milwaukee could still be counting their ballots until Wednesday morning. A few states I want to check in now in on is Georgia, as this has been very contested, one that Democrats have really been trying to flip this time around. Joe Biden right now with 41.8% of the vote, with Donald Trump with 57.1%. So Trump's got a good, pretty good lead there with 35% of the vote in. Let's also go now to um, Texas. This has taken quite a turn. This is one that uh, I'm sure Republicans are really watching right now. With 61% of the vote in at 9.15 Eastern time, Joe Biden's got 50% of the vote to Donald Trump's 48.7. Um, we're hearing that in Houston and in Dallas that Joe Biden is performing better than Hillary Clinton did four years ago. Um, so I'm sure that that is certainly a contribution to why we're seeing that so tight as well. Democrats have urged us that this is gonna be tight. It's a state that they've been trying to flip. Um, you know, Trump without Texas is going to create a lot of trouble for sure. So certainly something that we're looking at. And of course, let's check in now on our home state of North Carolina. Don't believe that that much has really changed. Um, we're still about 51 to 47.9, again, with about 79% of the vote. So not much has changed. But some other things that, uh, again, with New York, um, and New Mexico going for Joe Biden. We have the, both the Dakotas, Nebraska, um, and Wyoming going for uh, Trump as well. So again, um, it's going to be a long night, but there are certain states are letting, uh, this is a tight election to say that this is going to be a landslide one way or the other. Electorally, it may turn out that way, but in terms of uh, how, which candidate is going to win the state, they're going to be both very, very tight, but we'll keep you updated. Thank you, Baylor. We're now going to check in with Maeve Ashbrook. About 64% of the vote is being counted right now in North Carolina. We're going to check in with Maeve, who's following the local races. Maeve, do you have any updates for us? Yeah, and we heard from Ricky Hurtado earlier with John Sauber, but he's running against Republican incumbent of the North Carolina House of Representatives District 63 seat, Stephen Ross. Now a little bit on Ricky real quick just to get here. He is an instructor at UNC Chapel Hill and in his term, if elected, he wants to expand Medicare, raise teacher pay and go and raise minimum wage. 
Yes, as far as far as um, reopen NC, he is very supportive of Governor Cooper. And then Stephen Ross, he, like I said, is the incumbent. He's held this seat since he was elected in 2012, and he wants to create a vibrant downtown Alamance County. Take a look at a little bit more about these two candidates. Two candidates, one goal. Currently, our leaders are failing us. In this job experience counts. Democratic candidate Ricky Hurtado and incumbent Republican candidate Stephen Ross are both running to represent North Carolina's 63rd district, which includes the city of Graham, where the Confederate monument in Alamance County stands. Hurtado says he supports the monument being moved to an educational setting. I think that we certainly have to find ways to continue telling the full story of Alamance County and why that statue was there to begin with, but it certainly shouldn't be in a place of seat of power in our community. But Ross says the decision simply shouldn't be up to the district state representative, but instead the Alamance County commissioners. When you try to go in and make a decision for a community, that's when you usually create more problems, you know. Um, I've always been, and I, and I may even be the, the largest proponent uh, in the General Assembly for local control. Hurtado says current leaders are not doing enough to respond to racial injustice in the county, including recent incidents right here in Elon where Trump supporters yelled racist comments at students and faculty. Racism has no place in our community, and that's what we saw firsthand through Elon's campus and throughout Alamance County. I think it's incumbent on all leaders of our community at the local and state level to speak out against such injustice. Ross says he was out of town the weekend of the convoy, but wishes the county didn't have to worry about comments being made. I don't still don't know exactly what happened, but uh, you know, if, if things were said that I, I that I've heard were said, it's un, it's unfortunate. There's no place for that anywhere. As North Carolina continues to reopen amid the coronavirus pandemic, Ross says the process could have been smoother. But Hurtado says he is fully in support of Governor Roy Cooper's decisions. Maeve Ashbrook. Elon Local News. And we're now joined by presidential historian Mark Dollhouse. Dr. Dollhouse, thank you for joining us this evening. Good to be with you. Yeah, so my first question, according to the ELECT project, more than 100 million Americans, and here in North Carolina, 4.5 million people early voted. So what should we make of the early voting numbers in this election cycle? Yeah, it's a great question. I think uh, what we should make of the early vote numbers at this point is that they most likely are, uh, uh, could be giving us uh, a false image of what ultimately will happen. I think this is going to be a long night. I think that uh, patience uh, is in order. I think that there can be a red mirage, a blue mirage because of these early votes. I think what will really count, well, let me back up. I think the big story here really is the, the number of early voting Americans who voted uh, prior to today. Over 100 million Americans voted. That is incredible. Uh, that is, I think, on a par to put us with the election of 1900, which is over 120 years ago, which would be incredibly significant. So there's that. I yeah, and you know, there's been a lot of talk this election cycle about maybe not knowing who is going to win the presidency tonight. But you know, right. most election years, we don't actually know that. It's just projections. So why do you think so many people are concerned this year about not potentially knowing the winner tonight? Yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, there's a lot of concern because uh, there has been so much publicity that has been uh, uh, frankly exacerbated by uh, the president and by others, uh, as well as uh, people on the left who then have become very uh, worried about that. And I think there's sort of a, 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 a group mentality to that, a group think mentality, and people begin to, to spin the worst scenarios. And so I think that that's probably a lot of it. I think that, uh, you know, historically, that, that would not be uh, unusual if we do go into overtime. There is historical precedent for that. And so uh, I think our institutions are durable. And I think that most Americans uh, would, would uh, end up being supportive, I hope, of whoever does win this election. Yeah, and as we heard earlier in the show tonight, Jason Huster from the Elon Poll told me that youth voters tend to have higher turnout in competitive mm -hmm. and high stakes elections. But, you know, as I said, we've seen record numbers of early voting this year. So do you think that's true of all voters, not just youth? 
Uh, I, I do. I think, if, at least from the numbers I've seen, I think there have uh, there has been mobilization across the board of people coming out. Uh, in in part because I think to reference your your previous question, because people have been afraid about uh, voting in a pandemic, uh, uh, voting on today. So I think that that did drive the numbers up. And it certainly drove the youth the youth vote up, which I think is that's another very encouraging story that comes out of this election. No matter who wins tonight, the unprecedented numbers of uh, millennials and Gen Z who have voted in this election. Yeah, well, thank you for joining us tonight, Dr. Dollhouse. And right now we're hearing that 12 precincts are reporting. We're going to check in with Maeve Ashbrook following those local races. Maeve, what do you have for us right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so first of all, to start off with those 12 precincts reporting as far as the Alamance County Commissioner candidates, one thing that we're going to be looking at is right now at least the top three candidates, like I said, six candidates, three seats. It doesn't matter what your party is. The people with the three most number of votes are going to get those seats. Well, right now it's the three Republicans, John Paisley Jr., Pamela Thompson, and Bill Lashley Jr. Now. Now to get into it, now those are the three Republicans, like I said. Bill Lashley Jr., his father is currently on the Board of Commissioners, but he's stepping down. He himself has a background in business and finance. As far as John Paisley Jr., he's actually an Elon alumnus. He graduated in 1970. He's been a private practice lawyer in Alamance County. And as far as Pamela Thompson, she is a little bit involved in Alamance County politics. She's a member of the Board of Education, and she was the only member in, this, in the summer to vote for in-person classes for Alamance County. Now, ABSS is currently still doing online only classes. Brian, that's as far as the state of the race I have for you for the Alamance County Board of Commissioners. Back to you. Thank you, Maeve. We will check back in with you soon. We're now going to head over to Margaret Faust. She's on East Haggard Avenue. That road is closed for the next couple days. Margaret, how are things looking over there right now? Street. I haven't seen many students, you know, walking back and forth. Uh, between the two sides of campus. The police officers were here a few minutes before nine o'clock to set up these road barriers. Uh, the road closure starts across the street from Circle K and then goes all the way down East Haggard Avenue and the road opens back up again uh, past the library just before the academic pavilion. There is a second road closure tonight, Phoenix Drive, which is the uh, road that goes behind the Global and Loy neighborhoods is also closed. That's gonna be closed for the next two nights. Uh, only at night, though, it will be open during the day. Uh, East Haggard Avenue was closed for a community art project. The art project does not start until tomorrow, but the road is going to be closed until uh, this Thursday at 7 a.m. It will reopen. That is all I have for you on the road closure. Brian, back to you. Thanks, Margaret. And East Haggard runs right through the heart of campus, right in front of Alamance Fountain. And local and state health department quarantine regulations are expected to impact voting across the nation today. But some Elon students in quarantine are some of those who can't cast their vote in person. Senior Eduardo Gonzalez tested positive for COVID-19 last week and is staying at a close by hotel in Burlington. Gonzalez changed his voter registration to North Carolina. He told ENN he wants to cast his vote in a swing state. Now he's accepting that his voice may not be heard at all. It's kind of unfair to, I guess, punish me by not voting, by not being able to vote. But, um, I mean, I don't know what they can do to kind of make that right at the same time. Elon Vote Supervisor Bob Frigo says the organization has been encouraging students to vote early to avoid those quarantine situations. The Alamance County Board of Elections did not respond to a request for comment. And we're now going to check in with Baylor Rodman again. He's following the presidential race. Baylor, what updates do you have for us right now? Sure, yeah. ENN can now project that uh, Joe Biden will win the District of Columbia with its three electoral votes as well. I want to give you, though, a good update on North Carolina um, with our 15 electoral votes. It's been pretty tight. We still are about 50.2% for Joe Biden and 48.7% uh, for Donald Trump. On the Senate side, though, we got Cal Cunningham leading um, Tom Tillis with a 48 to 47. So, again, we're seeing some, looks like so far, we're seeing some cross ballot voting there. Again, certainly way too close to call. Let's uh, give you an update now on Pennsylvania as well. 
if I can click on that, there we go. 20 electoral votes, here we are. And we got 58.7% for Joe Biden with Donald Trump 40.3%. Again, just about 13% reporting there. Um, but uh, again, uh, that margin is still pretty big, but obviously, you know, Pennsylvania, we're gonna be waiting on a lot of votes for sure. So probably won't be able to make any sort of projection there tonight. I wanna also bring you to Ohio, where about we have 65% reporting, where Joe Biden is still there in the lead. Um, Electorally speaking, this could be kind of a bigger deal if Joe Biden is able to win Ohio than Florida as well, even though Ohio has less electoral votes. Um, the trends that we're so far seeing from voter analysis in Ohio and Pennsylvania and uh, kind of that upper Midwest there seems to be trending very much similarly, <laughs> if that makes sense. Also, we're hearing that Joe Biden is currently doing better than um, Hillary Clinton did for sure in 2016, especially with third party voters, as well as people who didn't necessarily vote at all in 2016. So. A lot of new numbers coming in. Um, again, in a lot of these big swing states, we knew it was going to be tight, right? Uh, but we're still unable to make a lot of these important projections in Florida, Ohio here, uh, of course, Pennsylvania, um, and Texas has still been very, very close for sure. Um, I think really no matter how that goes, it, it's certainly been a good night for Democrats in Texas. But that's what we got so far. And Brian, with the latest updates I have, I swear I'll bring them to you. But for now, we'll head back to you. Thanks, Baylor. We'll count on you. Following months of civil unrest and protests in the country, race relations is playing a role in this election, with both presidential candidates asked about it in the debates. Some members of the black community at Elon say there's a lot at stake. Alicia Powell says she didn't want to leave her apartment on election day for fears of her safety as a black woman. I've been harassed like three times last month, uh, one on campus, one two, twice off campus. Um, I see Trump flags driving around. I see people with guns sometimes. It's very scary. Powell says this election is about more than picking candidates. We're fighting for our country, like democracy completely. When was America great? You know, I feel like I've never gotten a full, ant like we've never gotten the full win. Is that when slavery was happening? Is that when white people were supreme? Kennedy Boston has been attending Black Lives Matter protests in the community, trying to make her voice heard. This is more than just who's going to be president. This is how will I continue to live my life in this country? Or how quickly should I be getting out of this country in order to continue to live my life as I have previously? Um, and that's a really terrifying thing to think about. Political science professor Damian Blake says this election cycle is unlike any other he's seen. In the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, Blake says people of color are facing two pandemics. There's also the pandemic on race and social justice. And so I think the, the results of the elections will further um, deepen and intensify the frayed race relations uh, in the, you know, Alamance and Burlington area. Powell says she hopes whoever inherits the presidency can create change for black Americans. I think they all try. I think they're politicians at the end of the day. Of the day so that means lies. That means empty promises sometimes because they have all high hopes. That's According to the North Carolina Board of Elections, 20% of registered voters in North Carolina are black. And ENN is now projecting that incumbent Ted Budd will win re-election in North Carolina's 13th Congressional District. We're going to head over to Maeve Ashbrook with more on that race. Maeve? Yeah, Brian, like you just said, Ted Budd has run, run, won a re-election, excuse me, to the United States House of Representatives, and he beat Navy veteran and small business owner Scott Huffman. Now, interesting fact about this, this is the first time Alamance County has ever been in the 13th District. It used to be in the 6th, so even though this is Budd's third term re-elected to this position. It's his first time serving Alamance County, and he says that all of the other colleges and universities in his old district will help him serve Elon students the best. Now, Brian, that's all I have. Back to you. Thank you, Maeve. We're going to check back in with Isabella Seaman over in Graham. Isabella, what's new over there? Yeah, Brian, so there has been two lawsuits that have come out of the march to the polls on Saturday. One lawsuit was filed by Reverend Gregory Drumright and Justice for the Next Generation. The other one has been filed by the ACLU of North Carolina. 
Now, I spoke with Amy Cooper, who was part of Alamance United and was part of one of the lawsuits, and she says that she wishes Saturday went a lot like today. Today went great. The numbers were amazing, and to see so many people supporting us here in Graham is amazing. I mean, I don't really know <laughs> how else to describe it. Um, it's great. Now, if you want to watch any of the press conferences from the Sheriff's Department, the Grand Police Department, and or Reverend Drumright, you can visit our website, elonnewsnetwork.com. Brian, back to you in the studio. Thank you, Isabella, for that update. Local Republicans are meeting in person tonight for a watch party event in our Ashland DeLowey is over there in Burlington. Ashlyn, how are things looking? Thank you, Ryan. We are a little two hours into this event here, hosted by the Alamance County GOP. Nearly 100 local Alamance County residents have been floating in and out of this room, watching the night unfold, as you see here on the projection right behind me. There has been some excitement and cheers for those states that President Trump is projected to win as of right now. But other than that, everyone here is ready and waiting for more of those results to come in. Stay tuned for more updates. Ryan, back to you. Thank you, Ashlyn. Some Elon students spent their day off their election day working at the polls. Elon senior Megan Norris spent 13 hours at Elon Elementary School greeting and directing voters. Norris says she wanted to be a poll worker because she heard a need for younger people to step up. So kind of a combination of like helping keep elderly folks safe while also like keeping elections running smoothly, but also like the pay is nice. <laughs> Lair Nor helped disabled voters cast their ballots so they didn't have to leave their car. She says she asked to be a curbside greeter because of COVID-19 concerns and greeters were stationed outside. Everyone's been really safe about masks and everything so far. Like I think I would have been safe being inside as well, but I wanted to be extra sure. Nor says there were only a few curbside voters today, but she says after her shift, she will attend a watch party. We're now going to check back in with Baylor Rodman, who's following that presidential race. Baylor, what updates do you have for us right now? Thanks, Brian. Yeah, uh, nothing new yet for President Trump in terms of things we're able to call for him. We can call Colorado, though, for Joe Biden, uh, not only winning that state, but we can also uh, pro project that uh, John Hickenlooper, who you know also ran uh, in the presidential primary here in 2020, then uh, dropped out and was a fr front runner for sure for the U.S. Senate race. He is beating Corey, he has beat Corey Gardner. Uh, we can project that as well. So Republicans will lose that seat there. That was considered a must win for Democrats, again, if they wanted a shot at taking over the majority. Um, but again, uh, that is, so those races are certainly something that we're following. I want to bring you to Ohio, though. This is where things get really interesting for sure. So we have Trump ahead here with just 0.7% of the vote. Um, but the mayor of Dayton, Ohio, Ann Whaley, says Biden's lead in Montgomery County is very, very encouraging. Uh, for the Biden campaign and how things may play out tonight. Montgomery County is one of those counties uh, where uh, not only that Dayton is located, but is a county that Trump carried four years ago that he flipped from the Obama era. So uh, they are looking pretty hopeful there. But again, uh, Trump still has that slight lead there in Ohio, so certainly not anything that we're going to be able to call relatively soon. Um, that's pretty much the latest I have for you. Thank you, Baylor, and we'll be right back. And we do have an update for you on the governor's race here in North Carolina. ENN is projecting that right now Roy Cooper is up by 51%, that is, with Dan Forrest, 47%. And again, about 70% of precincts are reporting right now, so not all the votes are counted yet. But we're going to head over to Maeve Ashbrook, who can talk a little bit more about this race. Maeve? Yeah, Roy Cooper was elected to his governorship in 2016, and Dan Forrest is his lieutenant governor. He's his Republican opponent. Now, if we're looking at a little bit more into those two candidates, Roy Cooper, if elected to a second term, says he wants to continue expanding Medicare in the state. He also wants to raise teacher pay, establish a paid parental leave, and he also wants to continue um, combating the opioid epidemic. He says that that was one of his biggest accomplishments in his first term. Now, as far as Dan Forrest, he is really interested in schools being able to choose whether they are opened or closed, defending the police, implementing voter ID laws. Now, Roy Cooper is the governor. He says that he has been establishing the reopen NC plan. He thinks it's going well. Forrest, however, says that he doesn't think it's gone so good. Thank you, Maeve. And we will keep watching that governor's race as the votes keep coming in. And now we're going to turn back to our student panel. Again, that is College Democrats President Alexis Malaguti and Daniel DeRosiak, who is the president of College Republicans. 
So ENN is projecting that Ted Budd will win re-election for North Carolina's 13th district in U.S. Congress. So for both of you, what does that mean for you know, North Carolina's control of Congress? Um, I, guess I'll, I guess I'll start with that since uh, Ted Budd is a Republican. Um, he, that, that's, uh, right now, based on what I've researched, it, we have a six to three lead in the uh, North Carolina uh, congressional like makeup of Republicans versus Democrats. And I think Ted Budd winning re-election uh, is incredibly important to show that Alamance County in this district, uh, the district that Ted Budd represents, is still you know, a conservative area and it still is uh, incredibly important to Republicans that he gets reelected. Um, I, I personally am excited that Ted Budd uh, got reelected. I did a lot of work on Ted Budd's campaign, and a lot of my members did work on Ted Budd's campaign. So, we're, you know, I, I saw that result come in, and I was extremely excited that all the work that we made really paid off. And I think he's going to do great dividends for, for, uh, for North Carolina. It's certainly not an exciting result for us at College Democrats, or for me personally at least, but it's also not com entirely unsurprising. I've lived in North Carolina my entire life, and knowing Alamance. Alamance County um, and the way that state Congress works here, I, it's not an, a surprising result. Yeah, and you know, we just gave a quick update on the governor's race again. About 70% of precincts are reporting with Roy Cooper leading right now by about 52%. So, you know, in terms of the governor's race and in regards to the pandemic, um, if Dan Forrest is elected, Daniel, do you think we can expect to see changes in the response to COVID-19 that Roy Cooper has been setting for the last couple months? Definitely. Um, I think, uh, first off, I just want to say that race is a lot closer than I anticipated it going to be. Um, I thought that, that Roy Cooper was going to win handedly in North Carolina. And the, fa and the fact that uh, Dan Forrest is that close, I think that's a, that's a really good sign. To answer your question, though, Brian, um, I definitely think from the, ins like from the moment Dan For if Dan Forrest gets reelected, um, he did make a promise that he would declare all businesses as essential. So uh, these, you know, business restrictions, the businesses that can't open, uh, size restrictions on the number of people who can attend events and gatherings, that will probably change immediately. So yes, I definitely think COVID uh, restrictions would change pretty drastically from what they are now. For you, um, if Governor Cooper is reelected, do you think we can expect to see some new policies around COVID-19? I think Cooper is planning on um, continuing with the regulations that he's had in place since the pandemic started. I know that he said um, prior to Halloween night, based on the results of whether or not people were going out and partying, we could end up going back to level one. Um, so that's always a possibility, but I think he's going to continue to be strong with his regulations and what businesses he considers essential. Yeah, and then one last question about the governor's race for both of you. Which candidate do you think would be better suited for supporting struggling local businesses being affected by the pandemic? Um, I think personally, uh, I like Dan Forrest in, in this regard. I think Dan Forrest has um, a good business I mindset to it, and I think he would really utilize um, government regulation and slashing of government regulation in order to really get business back on their feet. So I think he would um, really be more beneficial to North Carolina businesses. Um, I have a different answer, obviously. I think Roy Cooper is doing a wonderful job. Obviously, he cares about businesses, but he also cares about people and the, the health and safety of all of his constituents. And if, if his people aren't healthy, then businesses aren't going to thrive. Yeah, well, thank you both again for being here with us tonight. We appreciate you. And we're now going to check back in with John Sarver. He's over at a Democratic watch party in Burlington. John, what do you have for us? Thank you, Brian. I am here outside uh, the watch party for Democratic uh, 63rd House District candidate Ricky Hurtado, where people are anxiously waiting for election results to come in for this race in the 63rd District. And it is a tight one with in the race for incumbent Stephen Ross and Democrat Ricky Hurtado, the, with 10 out of the 20 precincts reporting, it is a 50 to 49 percentage rate, uh, the just under a thousand votes. And as they are awaiting the remainder of the precincts to report here in Burlington, Brian, back to you. Thank you, John, and stay with us as ENN continues our special coverage of Election Night 2020.
We're going to check back in with Ashlyn DeLowey again. She's at a Republican watch party in Burlington. We're going to head on over there. Ashlyn, what's new? Thank you, Brian. I am now joined by Omar Logo, um, an Alamance County resident, as well as, oh, we have some cheers behind me right now as more results are coming in the way. But I'm also here with Alamance County resident um, and runner of the Alamance County Latinos for Trump. Um, thank you so much for joining me tonight, My Omar. Um, what brings you here tonight? Well, uh, basically Trump and our local candidates, you know, we're looking forward to, for them to be elected tonight. Awesome. Um, and how are you feeling going into the, you know, the rest of the night? Lots of more results to come, but how are you feeling right now? Well, for me, it's, uh, it's personal because uh, I come, you see, I'm from Venezuela. I'm a former um, refugee from Venezuela. And I came here, um, you know, back, I mean, 20 years ago, and I wasn't able to vote. Uh, coming from a communist country, I really enjoy this freedom uh, to the point that I, I'm willing to defend it. Um, our president is the one that I see, in, you know, um, actually defending this freedom that we have, um, being able to accomplish so many, so many tasks, so many goals, you know, in such a period, so, such a such a short period of time, uh, it's impressive. And therefore, I think that he needs, you know, our support and also our local candidates as well. Amazing. Well, there you have it. Omar Logo, stay tuned for more updates. Brian, back to you. Thank you, Ashlyn. We're going to head over to Baylor Rodman. And Baylor, right now I'm seeing here in North Carolina, about 74% of precincts are in. Joe Biden right now leading 49.47 with Donald Trump at 49.14. So very close race right here in North Carolina right now. But what other updates do you have for us? Yeah, that's pretty much what I got over here, Brian. Just a, a tiny percent of a percentage off. Um, this is really close, really, really close for sure. Again, not only is Joe Biden and Donald Trump, the, I mean, the, the, I just can't believe how close this is. Actually, in North Carolina, we said in the pre-show, Brian, it could all come down to the 15 electoral votes in North Carolina, and that may, that may very well be the case. Again, also very, very close between um, Tom Tillis and Cal Cunningham, not as close between Governor Roy Cooper and uh, Dan Forrest, although I think um, some are saying that Forrest is doing better than they uh, had anticipated. Again, we're not ready to call that race yet, um, but again, those margins are definitely a lot larger. I want to bring you now, though, to Wisconsin. I, oh, okay. Well, let's go to Florida. I've already clicked on it. Uh, Florida here, uh, again, the president's still up 51.3 to Joe Biden's 47.8. So again, even with those, uh, a lot of more uh, early mail-in ballots have been coming in and receiving um, and have been received, but Trump is still doing pretty well uh, in terms of the lead there. But again, I really did want to bring you to Wisconsin. Did I click on it? There it did. The 10 electoral votes and uh, with 31% reporting, we can see here that uh, Donald Trump has a small lead there with 50.9% of the vote, with Joe Biden at 47.6% of the vote. Also, um, Milwaukee and Green Bay, um, apparently their, their votes are going to be a little bit later than usual. Um, and uh, and also in Madison, they're reporting the uh, results faster than they anticipated. So uh, a lot of chaos in terms of counting the votes going on in Wisconsin uh, between some of those major cities. But again, with 31% uh, of the vote, we got uh, Trump leading in there. And let's go to Michigan. And the reason I'm bringing these up, right, is because these are all states that pushed the president over the top there. And yes, we only have 16% reporting. Um, so just a few precincts that are in, but Trump has a pretty big lead there with 57.6% of the vote to Joe Biden's 40%. Point six. And the reason I bring this up, right, is because if we look back, we haven't done this yet, but if we look back to 2016, you can see it was the Wisconsin, the Michigan, the Pennsylvania that put him over the top. So that's why we're really certainly looking at these. But it's going to be a long night before we can make any projections on that front. Brian, back to you. Thank you, Baylor. And we are now heading into our next hour of coverage here of the 2020 election. And we do have an update on the race for the U.S. Senate here in North Carolina. As you can see, about 70% of precincts are reporting right now with Tom Tillis leading by a few percentage points. We're going to head over to Maeve Ashbrook with more on this race. Maeve? 
Yeah, Brian, this has been said to be a really important race as far as the balance of the Senate potentially. Tom Tillis is the incumbent, but Cal Cunningham, he's a Democrat, former North Carolina state senator, also a retired military officer. And he, and he says that as far as reopening North Carolina, he thinks Governor Roy Cooper has done a great job. If elected, he says he wants to continue providing widespread testing across the state and also increase personal protective equipment so we can open the state with, quote, peace of mind. Now, as far as Tom tells, like I said, he's leading with 49% right now. He is the incumbent Republican senator um, reopening North Carolina. He says we're in a good position, but it's more important protecting the physical health and economic is not mutually exclusive. So health economy, two different things, not necessarily mutually exclusive. That's all I have for you right now. Brian, back to you. Thanks, Maeve. As results come in, Associate Professor of Political Science Carrie Eaves says students and voters should trust the validity excuse me, of the election. President Trump has said that he may not accept the outcome of the election. And according to the most recent Elon poll, 36% of registered North Carolina voters say they are not at all confident that President Trump will accept the results of the election as valid. I think it's important that we trust the process and let it play out as it's supposed to. And then we can talk about what that means and its influences and its impacts on our institutions. But it might just take some time. And so I think part of it is I would urge just patience going forward. Eves, who specializes in American government, says students should look at post-election resources on the Elon Votes website, including a panel discussion with political science faculty on November 5th. And we're going to check back in with Isabella Seaman. She's on the ground in Graham. Isabella, what's new? Yeah, Brian, so let's talk about precincts. There are 38 precincts in Alamance County. There were 37 on Super Tuesday, but now they broke two up for social distancing, making it 38. So if we look right now, 25 of the 38 precincts are now reported. That's 65 percent. But so that comes together as 70 percent of the votes for Alamance County have been counted. Now you can see there isn't a line behind me, but just 20 minutes ago, there was a long line. There could only be two people, two precinct judges from each precinct in at one time for them to collect the ballots that they had. Now, talking more about the precincts, so there has been 70% of the votes in, and we're just waiting on those final votes to come in because it does look like most of the precincts, since no one is in the parking lot anymore, have been delivered. So we're just waiting on those live results to be computed and they will be up shortly. Brian? Thank you, Isabel. We will check back in with you later. But for right now, we're going to head over to Baylor Rodman with an update on the national race. Baylor. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, Ian and can now project that Donald Trump will win the state of Kansas as well. So now he's up to 98 electoral votes to Biden's 131. Uh, it is too early to call the Senate race there, um, but uh, it looks like Republicans are looking pretty good as um, Roger Marshall seems to be in the lead to Barbara Bollier. Um, so again, it's too early to call that, but it's something that we're looking at. And we're getting new results in Arizona. The polls there just closed, but it's 11 electoral votes. And of course, this is something, uh, a state that Joe Biden really wants to uh, take over as you know, all the Democrats do, and he's currently in the lead there with 53.8% of the vote, with uh, 45 to Trump, with just about 48% of uh, the precincts reporting. And we can also report that Mark Kelly, the Democrat there, is over Republican incumbent Marsha, uh, I'm sorry, not Marsha Blackburn, uh, Republican incumbent Martha McSally, excuse me. And uh, so again, that is a state uh, in terms of the Senate race there, the Democrats again would need to win, uh, Mark Kelly would need to win over Martha McSally there if Democrats want a shot at the uh, Senate majority most likely. Again, uh, Republicans look like they could afford to lose that one, uh, but we're still monitoring that and we'll of course bring you all of that analysis and updates about what that means on the federal layout once we have more concrete information. But we can say so far in Arizona's 11th, 53.8 for Biden, 45 for Trump, which is 48% reporting. And again, we can confirm that Donald Trump has won the state of Kansas. That's the latest I got for you, Brian. Thank you, Baylor, and stay with us. We'll be right back. And right now we do have an update on one of the local races we're following, and that is for North Carolina's State House in District 63 and 64. Maeve Ashbrook is gonna tell us a little bit more about that race, Maeve. Yeah, Brian, there are only 10 of 19 precincts reporting right now in Alamance County as far as this race. But what we're looking at is 57% um, 
Dennis Riddell, the incumbent, and 42% Eric Henry. Now, a little bit about these candidates. Eric Henry, he is the Democrat. He's a president of CEO of a t-shirt design company in Burlington. Big part of his campaign, climate change, much different from incumbent Dennis Riddell, who is currently, like I said, the incumbent. He's been in office since 2013, and he really wants to help small businesses affected by the pandemic be able to rebuild if reelected. Now, a well, fun fact about this race, Riddell and Henry are actually live right across the street from each other. They're neighbors and best friends. So even though it's a competitive race, in the end, there's some, there's some love there between those two candidates. Brian, back to you. Thank you, Maeve. We're going to check back in with Baylor Rodman following the presidential race. Baylor, what's new? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Brian. Sorry about that. The, the North Carolina just keeps changing. First, Biden was up 3,000 votes. Now, Donald Trump is up about 3,000 votes. So we're at a percentage tie right here with, again, Trump leading in about 3,000 votes overall here in North Carolina. Um, and uh, with about 88% of the precincts reporting. And Tom Tillis also up about 3,000 votes uh, as well. So again, a lot of pr uh, down party voting in terms of the president's race and in terms of the um, Senate race as well, but again, Roy Cooper still seems to maintain a little bit of a lead there as well. Uh, Arizona, we should start get um, yeah, we should start getting more results in there in the next few minutes as well. And of course, I really want to bring you to um, Georgia with its 16 electoral votes, um, as Donald Trump still seems to be in the lead there uh, with 57.1 to 41.8. We can also project, I never got to announce this earlier with all the breaking numbers with North Carolina. That's of course the one that we're really following strictly, but all 50 states matter, right? And so Louisiana, we were able to call that um, for President Trump as well. So that gets him up to that 98. So the numbers haven't changed. I just never announced to you that Louisiana went Trump's way. So I want to make sure to do that. And we continue to be looking at Florida with its 49 electoral votes. Uh, Donald Trump with 91% of the precincts reporting still seems to maintain a little bit of a lead there. Again, too close to call for a lot of these things, but things seem to be shifting a little bit, um, but it's very, very back and forth here in North Carolina, especially. So as soon as I have the latest updates, uh, I will bring that to you as well. Again, um, just to our neighbors to the South, South Carolina went Trump's way, but also you should know that Lindsey Graham, the uh, senator from there, an incumbent Republican, won his seat. Of course, Democrats poured a lot of money into that. That was one that they really wanted to flip as well. They did not do that this evening. So Lindsey Graham remains the senior senator from South Carolina. Brian. Thank you, Baylor. Very tight race for sure right now in North Carolina between the two candidates. We will continue watching that. But for now, we're going to head over to Ashlyn DeLowey. She's at a Republican watch party in Burlington. Ashlyn, how are things going? <laughs> There's a lot of cheering going on there. We couldn't quite hear Ashlyn, so we will check back in with her in a few minutes. But again, we're going to head to commercial right now. Tune in in a few minutes to be back with us. Welcome back. We're going to check back in with Baylor Rodman following that presidential race. Baylor? Thank you so much, Brian. I want to take you to Texas now because we have a little bit of an update there. Um, I think the last time I brought this to you, Biden was in the lead, but we uh, have Trump there in the lead now with 50.4% of the vote, with 48.3 to Joe Biden, with 67% of our precincts reporting. And I want to bring you to Pennsylvania now. Again, they're going to be counting ballots for a while out there for sure. Um, so don't know that we'll have an answer to this tonight, but this is one of the first times we've seen Trump in the lead now here in uh, Pennsylvania uh, as well with just 19% of the precincts reporting. I think you're seeing amongst Pennsylvania, amongst a lot of the other states, they're, you know, slowly but surely trying to count their way there. Um, but uh, again, he's got 50.9 to Joe Biden's 46.1. And uh, Let's go again to North Carolina because it really just is so close. If you missed it just a few minutes ago, uh, Donald Trump now has a little bit of a, a wider margin here between uh, Joe Biden with 49.7 to 49.1 percent of the vote. Again, Tom Tillis still in a slight lead over Cal Cunningham as well um, with, again, 88 percent of our precincts reporting. So uh, this is going to be certainly very tight. 
And um, uh, let's take you to Michigan, too, because we didn't do that yet on this hit. And with its 16 electoral votes, we still have Donald Trump there with 57.6% of the vote over Joe Biden with 406 But again, just 16% of our precincts are reporting. So we're certainly going to have to keep our eye on that. A lot of things changing, a lot of things going on. And I'll bring you the latest updates when we have them. Brian. Thank you for that, Baylor. We're going to go back over to Ashland DeLowey at the Republican Watch Party, where it was very lots of excitement going on earlier. Ashlyn, what's all the excitement about? Thank you. I am now joined by Natalie, a local student here at Southern Alamance. Al Natalie, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Um, Natalie, as a young student here at North Carolina, what are you most looking forward to for tonight? Um, I'm looking forward to hopefully seeing North Carolina stay red and um, hopefully if it turns out the way I'm hoping, you know, I'll be starting coming in as a young adult. It's so important to have a strong economy and coming into that it's just, it's so crucial to get out and vote. And I really, really hope that, you know, North Carolina stays red and Trump pulls it out for another four great years. And again, what does it mean to you? What does this election mean to you right now? I, it's so important. I mean, I'm 17 now, 18 next year. I mean, it's just, it, I don't really know how to stay. Four years. Continue to do that. He's done nothing but himself and continue to build up our economy and work hard for the people of America. And I hope he gets to continue to do that. Natalie, thank you so much for chatting with me. You thank heard you. it here. Stay tuned for more and cheers and excitement results come in. Thank you so much. Back to you. Thank you, Ashlyn. Our Margaret Faust took a look at the historic early voting numbers in North Carolina. Take a look. Junior Katie Zimmerman decided to vote early this year, worried COVID could get in the way if she waited until day of voting. Really scared of maybe having to quarantine and then not being able to go and vote. Um, so it was really good just to have it done with. And like, no matter what happens to me now, I cast my ballot. She says she waited in line for an hour and a half at the Mebane Arts and Community Center, one of five early voting locations in Alamance County. She says people were fairly spread out and most were wearing masks. Her voting experience was similar to mine at Elmira Community Center. I walked in and the lady made sure I had my mask on. She gave me some hand sanitizer and she gave me the I voted pen. And then I went to, I guess, like verify I was who I said I was. And then they handed me, I guess, like the blank ballot. And then they gave me a Q-tip so you weren't actually touching the screen. I went to go stand and wait for someone to bring me to the voting booth and then I voted and then I got my paper ballot. I like put it into a scanner and then I left. Zimmerman says by voting she is doing her part to make her voice heard. My mom always took me to go vote with her when I was a little girl and so until I started learning more about American history and voting and voting rights I just thought that like Everyone voted. I didn't realize how low voter turnout in America was until I was older. Zimmerman says having a female candidate for vice president on the ballot reminds her that women have only had the right to vote for about 100 years. Margaret Faust, Elon Local News. Coming up, John Starber has another interview for us at the Democratic Watch Party here in Alamance County. Stay with us. We're now going to check in with John Sarver. He's stationed at a Democratic watch party in Burlington. John, what do you have for us? Thank you, Brian. I am here at the uh, Ricky Hurtado watch party here in Burlington with the campaign uh, uh, manager. campaign manager and uh, Long day. Alamance County Democratic chair, Elaine Berry. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And first, uh, I want to just kind of talk a little bit. It's a, it's a really tight race between H Ricky Hurtado and Stephen Ross. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the margin is just a little over 500 votes with 16 of the precincts reported. Just give me a, a, a kind of a look into what, what's going to happen over the course of the next couple hours in terms of getting those final results and what, what's kind of the next step for the campaign. Okay, we, uh, we're obviously waiting to see how it's going to play out. We've looked at the precincts and we hope that our turnout equals the Republican turnout. If it did, then um, we may be able to take this one home. Um, of course, no matter what happens, we are going to be looking at provisional ballots uh, after the race. So there will still be some work left for us to do and for the other side. And uh, working with this, this campaign over the course of this election cycle, could you tell me about your experience working on this campaign and, and how important this, uh, this seat is for the uh, North Carolina legislature? Yeah, well, I, I worked on uh, Erica McAdoo's 
campaign in 2018, and she lost by 298 votes. And uh, when she decided not to run, um, and I moved to Ricky's campaign to try to help him win, um, we were really we had a plan for what we were going to do, and of course COVID came along. So um, we tried to do the best we can. We've utilized a lot of different things, like we really relied heavily on digital, and we ran some TV ads. Um, but uh, our canvassing was really restricted uh, because of COVID. So um, it's only recently that we've been out doing lit drops, and we've done a ton of phone banking and card writing. So we, um, we're hoping that we're gonna, we've attracted some new young voters, and we have a person of color running, so we hope that that appeals to a diverse uh, group of voters, and we're hoping we can bring this home for the state. As far as what difference it'll make, um, if we can get a Democratic majority in the State House and in the Senate, then we'll be able to pass some measures that will improve medical care, improve our public schools, uh, and we believe uh, help the economy uh, become uh, something that's more available, a working economy more available to every citizen. And can you just give me a sense, as the night progresses, kind of give me a sense of just like the, the atmosphere within the campaign and just kind of what, what are you guys feeling as you're waiting for these final results to come in? Um, yeah. We're feeling, trying to feel patient. Um, it's been a long campaign. Uh, Cindy uh, Wright and I started working for the campaign way back in July. I'm trying to lay, lay the groundwork for this campaign. Um, so to have the first Latino uh, Democratic uh, House of Representatives uh, candidate, um, well, actually, I guess if he wins, he will be the first legislator who is of Latino heritage. Um, I think that would be tremendous. I think it's a voice that needs to be heard. Um, and we were really hoping with the diverse slate of candidates that we ran in the county that we would be able to have more victory. But if we can get this one, it will be a real prize, and we think you'll do a fabulous job. Ms. Barry, thank you very much for joining me uh, tonight for our uh, live interview. Uh, Brian, back to you in the studio. Bye, guys. Thank you, John. Thank now you. going to turn to the national race and head over to Baylor Rodman. Baylor? Hi, Brian. Yes, here you can see, I'm going to try and squeeze in here, <laughs> that uh, right now in terms of the U.S. Senate race, we're looking, um, both parties are doing pretty well right now with 41 uh, for the set in stone for the Democrats, 41 for the Republicans. Two that are uh, really those close contested races that we're still waiting on um, that, of course, are too close to call is currently in Maine. Um, Susan Collins versus Sarah Gideon. Susan Collins is the Republican incumbent there. Um, Going into polling, she was not looking too well. She is currently in the lead there, but again, just a handful of pre uh, precincts are uh, reporting right now. And then Arizona seems to be going Mark Kelly's way, the Democrat over incumbent Republican Martha McSally. And I'm gonna take you to Arizona right now on the presidential level because we got a boatload of uh, reports there. With our 11 electoral votes, we, can, uh, we have so far that Joe Biden up 53.9 to Donald Trump 44.8. Biden so far leading in Maquoqua uh, County by 10 points uh, with three quarters of the vote that is already counted. Um, so again, leading that county by 10 points, very important uh, county for Democrats. And again, he's got a pretty big margin there with uh, th uh, again, three quarters of all the votes there already counted. Um, so if that lead holds up, it's gonna be very hard for Trump to recover to take those 11 electoral votes as it did four years ago and as Republicans have done for the last 25 years. Things are getting very contentious here though in North Carolina and you heard from our John Sarver who was live at the Democratic headquarters. I actually got to speak with both the chairs of the um, Democratic and Republican Alamance County uh, headquarters uh, and talked with them and students about why they felt it was important uh, for students to re-register here in North Carolina and how the student vote could persuade the county. So let's take a look at that. Elon Votes has so far registered more than 25% of undergraduate students for the first time, placing Elon as the eighth highest university in the nation that uses TurboVote. Of the over 1,500 first-time voters at Elon, many are also choosing to register here in Alamance County. I think people should think of Elon as part of the community more than we do right now. Although it can feel like a bubble sometimes, we are part of this community, we should be active in this community. For Wood, it's about making sure his vote counts. Some recent changes that have been made with the mailing service, I was uncomfortable doing an absentee ballot from my state, which is uh, the state of Alabama. A higher number of students voting in our surrounding neighborhood could certainly impact the outcome of not only those statewide races, but 
but also contested local ones. Chair of Alamance County Democrats Elaine Berry says she believes students can make all the difference to turn Alamance blue this November. I will tell you, uh, in 2018, I worked for Erica McAdoo, who was uh, a young candidate running for state legislature, and uh, she was a first-time candidate. She lost by 298 votes. So to ask me that question is, it can make all the difference in the world. Meanwhile, Alamance County Republicans Chair Ben York says he thinks there's an assumption that more students register to vote throughout the county is bad for the Republican Party. But he believes in the end, they'll turn out to vote in his party's favor. It's whether those folks um, uh, make an effort to learn about the different candidates. Both party chairs believe that students have the right to vote here in Alamance County, even as some vote here purely due to the competitive nature of the state in presidential elections. I think that should be allowed because they live here. Um, if they're living here, whether it's in a dorm, whether they're renting a home. I think it's ridiculous to say, why should these people vote here? Some of them are going to stay here. Some are going to make, the, some of them are going to make this their home. Um, and I would venture to say most of them are going to make it a better place for all of us. And here in North Carolina, as it stands right now with our 15 electoral votes, President Trump is still in the lead with 49.8 percent of the vote as opposed to Joe Biden's just even 49. That's about a 40,000 vote difference currently between the two. And looking at the U.S. Senate race between Tom Tillis, the Republican incumbent, and Democrat Cal Cunningham, we're seeing very similar trends uh, along, um, again, very close, uh, just a few uh, tens of thousands of votes in between them. And again, uh, Tillis ahead, as with Trump. Again, um, so that's what we have so far. But again, Brian, I'll send it back to you. And again, as soon as I have that update, I'll let you know. Thank you, Baylor. We're going to turn now to the North Carolina State Senate race here in District 24. I'm looking at the results right now. 38 of 53 percincts are reporting with Republican Amy Gailey up by just over 51 percent right now. So we're going to head over to Maeve to tell us more about that race. Maeve. Yeah, Amy Gailey and J.D. Wooten are running to replace Rick Gunn, who's held this seat since 2011, but he's stepping down. Gailey, like I said earlier, she's the chair of the Alamance County Commissioners currently, and like Brian said, she's leading with just above 51.94% of the vote. And J.D. Wooten, he also ran for the seat against Gunn in 2018. He's an Air Force veteran and an intellectual property attorney. He did lose in 2018, but says that Joe Biden is actually who inspired him to run for a second time. Brian, that's what I have back to you. Thank you, Maven. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for ENN special coverage of election night 2020. We'll be back in a half hour at 11 with more results for you. Stay put. Welcome back to Elon News Network special coverage night of election night 2020. Since we last saw you, we have numerous projections about many local races happening right here in North Carolina. So to begin, ENN is projecting that Governor Roy Cooper will win a second term in office with 52% of the vote about. Um, and the Alamance County Commissioner is moving more locally. Three Republicans um, will now serve on the County Board of Commissions. Those are Bill Lashley Jr., John Paisley Jr., and Pamela Thompson. Um, and in North Carolina's State House, um, District 63, Ricky Hurtado will win. He won just over 50% of the vote. And in District 64, Dennis Riddell will win that seat. He won just about 59% of the vote. And I'm just hearing in my ear right now, we can also call Amy Gailey for North Carolina Senate District 24 um, with about 51 precincts of 53 reporting. And she has about 52% of the vote. So with all of this, we're going to head over to Maeve Ashbrook for more on all of these races and what these projections mean. Maeve? 63. Very tight race in Ricky Hortado. He's an instructor at UNC Chapel Hill. Beat incumbent Stephen Ross. Ross was also the mayor of Burlington, a city councilman, and 50% of the vote, vote for Ricky Hurtado. In his term, he says that he wants to expand Medicare in the state, also raise the teacher pay and the minimum wage. Also moving on to another North Carolina State House Representatives, District 64. We're calling Dennis Riddell over his opponent, Eric Henry. Riddell is also the incumbent. He is the Republican candidate there. And he wants to help small businesses affected by the coronavirus pandemic. It yeah, and we're also going to go Alamance County Commissioner winners, right? Again, I want to reiterate, there were six candidates, three spots. Didn't matter what party it is, whoever had the most votes wins. And again, these are the three Republicans. They had the most vote. John Paisley Jr., Pamela Thompson, Bill Lashley. Bill Lashley's father currently serves on the county commissioners. He is stepping down. 
Pamela Thompson is currently a member of the Alamance Burlington School System Board of Education and John Paisley Jr. is a private practice lawyer here in Alamance County. Also, as Brian said, the North Carolina governor's race, we're calling Roy Cooper, incumbent Democratic governor. He's the 75th of the state. He's hoping in his second term, he says, to, in, to continue to expand Medicare in the state, ha, um, raise teacher pay, start um, a paid paternal leave. He wants to start this and continue to combat the opioid epidemic. He says that that was one of his biggest accomplishments in office and also that North Carolina Senate District 24 State Senate, just to make that very clear. Amy Gailey, she's the chair of the Alamance County Commissioner, so we'll be interested to see who becomes the chair of the Alamance County um, Commissioners after this. J.D. Wooten, he has lost. He was a Democrat. This is the second time he has lost that seat, but first time he's losing it to Gailey. Like I said, Gailey is the current chair of the Alamance County Commissioners. Brian, back to you. Thank you, Maven. With a handful of those Positions going to Republicans. We're going to head over to Ashlyn Deloey. She's at a Republican watch party over in Burlington. Ashlyn, what are things like over there given these seats going to Republicans? We apologize for those technical difficulties. Now we're going to head over to Baylor Rodman, who has been following the presidential election. You know, over the last half hour, we have some new updates from Baylor. So, Baylor, what's new? We do absolutely not only updates with the presidential election, but also with the U.S. Senate races as well. We can say uh, we can call uh, the Idaho Senate race for Republicans as well as uh, Idaho for uh, Donald Trump's count for his uh, bringing him up to 112 electoral votes and a lot of numbers. Biden's numbers just grew drastically for sure up to 209 large part of that obviously is from California and all 55 it's its of its electoral votes as well as Washington and Oregon all going for Biden as well so again as we get later into the evening we start to get the western states in and again um, all pretty much on on track with those trends there between um, you know California Oregon Washington of course going to the Democrats Idaho for Republicans nothing quite new there and I do want to fill you in on North Carolina uh, with our 15 electoral votes we've been saying all night uh, that it really could be these 15 that determine uh, one over the other and we have Donald Trump still with a small lead here with 49.9 percent of the vote with uh, Joe Biden with 48.9 uh, with about a 58,000 vote margin in between those two Obviously, we, we called uh, Roy Cooper to be reelected the governor um, of uh, North Carolina. That being said, there's clearly some uh there's some cross uh, party uh, voting here, not only for Trump, but also Tom Tillis is still ahead very slightly, but still ahead in his Senate race as well. And again, if Republicans want to hold on to the majority, uh, that is something that they're cer certainly looking at for sure. Um, so a lot of different uh, updates there, but it's still very, very tight here in the Tar Heel State. We'll keep you updated, Brian. Thanks, Taylor. We're going to check back in with Ashlyn Deloey over at that Republican watch party in Burlington. Ashlyn, how are things going over there? <laughs> And you can hear now the cheers are going on as the results have come in. We actually just reported that the county commissioner race is in and the Republican candidates have won and all of those. I am now joined by Paul Williams here to talk with me today on this. Paul, oh, I, I'm excited that all three of the Republican candidates have won. Uh, I hope that they can all continue to make Alamance County a better county for all the residents. And I'm just excited. I'm a 30-year paramedic with Alamance County, and I see nothing but better things for, them, for us now. Great. Thank you, Paul. Things are starting to wrap up here, but back to you in the studio. Thank you, Ashlyn. And we will be right back in just a few minutes. Stay with us. Yes, you know, I'm following the election results right here on my computer right next to me. And, you know, things are looking very close here in North Carolina right now. Um, just about 97% of precincts reporting. Right now, President Trump is leading by 49.95% with former Vice President Joe Biden behind him, 48.6%. But again, that margin is so small and still votes are coming in and, you know, absentee ballots can be counted until November 12th. So, you know, like Baylor has said, this this race here in North Carolina is very close and could determine which candidate takes the presidency. So we're going to head over to Baylor Rodman to give us some more clarity about all of this. Baylor. 
Thank you so much, Brian. Yeah, North Carolina again. We're just getting even new results in as of right this minute at 1110 Eastern Time. 94% of uh, the precincts reporting with 50.1% of the vote for Trump. Joe Biden, 48.7% of the vote as well. I also want to be sure that we call um, New Hampshire, uh, I haven't updated the, oh, that's Maine. Well, we're still waiting on the results in Maine with 20% reporting. Uh, Trump's still a slight margin there, but we want to click on New Hampshire. New Hampshire, New Hampshire, can I get you? There we go, our four electoral votes, and we can project uh, that Joe Biden will win the state of New Hampshire with 53.3% of the vote to Donald Trump's 45. Uh, Biden had a pretty substantial lead coming into the night here, um, but again, still considered a swing state, one that we were certainly covering uh, closely, so we want to make sure to update that. And uh, we are unable to officially call it at this point, but a lot of the networks are already already calling Florida uh, for President Trump as well. We're continuing to look at those numbers and we'll be ready to call that probably in just a few moments again for President Trump. But as soon as we are officially able to, I will bring that to you. We know you will. Thanks, Baylor. We're now going to head over to Isabella Seaman, who's live in our newsroom with an update for us tonight. Isabella? Absolutely. So we're just going to talk a little bit about what our team is doing here. So right here we have one of our co-producers, Christian Galvano. He's updating himself on the latest numbers across the way. We have now if you take a look down the way with me right over here, we have Mackenzie and Ellis who are Brian, let's check back with you in the studio. Yeah, thank you, Isabella. Our team is hard at work there in the newsroom. As you can see, they're all in masks and staying, staying physically distant too to Make sure we're all staying safe. Uh, stay with us. We'll be right back in just a few moments. And welcome back. And again, a state we're keeping our eye on tonight is Florida. You know, it could go, like Baylor said, for either candidate. So now we're going to take a look um, at a story about the vote in Florida sent to us from the University of Miami. In the final days before this election, both President Trump and former Vice President Biden took their campaigns back to the Sunshine State with dueling rallies in Tampa. Five days from now, we are going to win Florida. We are going to win four more years in the White House. The heart and soul of this country is at stake right here in Florida. It's up to you. You hold the key. If Florida goes blue, it's over. Trump won Florida in 2016 by over 1% or about 100,000 votes. But Barack Obama won the state in both 2008 and 2012. And he campaigned in Orlando to help Biden turn the state back to blue. But he and I came from different places. We came from different generations. But I quickly came to admire Joe as a man who learned early to treat everybody he meets with dignity and respect. Florida presidential races are often close, too close to call. In 2000, it came down to 537 votes in a recount that was halted by the Supreme Court. For its very closeness can serve to remind us that we are one people with a shared history and a shared destiny. I was not elected to serve one party, but to serve one nation. Both candidates keep swinging through the swing state in an effort to keep this chapter of Florida history from repeating itself. Florida voter registrations are nearly evenly divided, with only 134,000 more Democrats than Republicans, just over 5 million each. But nearly 4 million people are not affiliated with a political party here, making their votes up for grabs. With record-breaking turnout, both sides are counting on Floridians to bring them 29 electoral votes closer to winning the White House. We're now going to check in with Ashlyn DeLowey. She's over at the Republican Watch Party in Burlington. And Ashlyn, it looks like behind you things are wrapping up. So tell us, how did the event go? The Alamance County GOP event has officially ended. As you can see, there's not many people here left and everyone's starting to clean up. Chairman Ben York ended the night saying his condolences for the defeat of Stephen Ross, but also applauded the winnings of Republican candidates for the county commissioner race. York also said that it was a great night tonight, and he thanked all the volunteers who have made this event possible, um, who have been working at the GOP headquarters up until election night. Um, he also said that Donald Trump, they are ready for the next four years and hoping and are hopeful as they leave the night. That's all I have for you right now. Back to the studio. Thank you, Ashlyn. We're now going to check in with Maeve Ashbrook on the county commissioner's race, and we know that those three seats went to Republicans. So, Maeve, tell us about them. 
Yeah, Brian, like I've said before, it's these three Republican candidates for Alamance County Commissioner that have won those three seats. So let's get to know these three people a little bit better as they're going to be representing this county. First off, Bill Lashley, as I've said several times throughout the night, his father sits on the Board of Commissioners right now, but he's stepping down. His personal background is in business and finance. One of the things he says is that it's your decision whether or not you should be able to wear a mask. But I'm a firm believer in individual rights. And I believe that you, as an individual, should be able to make that decision. You shouldn't have the government dictating to you how you're going to live your life, how you feel that you need to mitigate risk. John Paisley Jr. is an Elon alumnus. He graduated in 1970 again, private practice lawyer here in Alamance County. And one big thing on him is that he currently works on the Parks and Recreation Board and authority and he used to be actually the chair of the state board of elections. Um, one thing that he says is that Elon University where of course he is an alumnus is doing a good job reopening. I think Elon is taking very proactive uh, steps to correct that issue and I think with the proper steps we as a nation can do that. And finally, Pamela Thompson, as I've said before, she is on the Alamance Burlington School System Board of Education and she's an Alamance County native. So she's very familiar with this area. She's grown up here. One of the big things she's running on is what she calls the drug crisis here in Alamance County. This is one of the things she's really hoping to fix as a commissioner. Now back to um, that ABSS tie. She is the only member who did vote for in-person classes. And one of her things is that, that she thinks that the key to getting the economy back up is reopening the schools. Um, kindergarten has to learn how to walk on a straight line, not sit at a computer all day long. It's just, and families are having to learn to be teachers, and that's what they pay us to do. Yeah, and as I said again, these three Republican candidates are those three people who will be stepping on to the Alamance County Board of Commissioners. Brian, back to you. Thank you, Maeve. Stay with us for more updates on this election night 2020. And what you're seeing right now is live video from a Joe Biden watch party in Wilmington, Delaware. Speaking of Joe Biden, we're going to head over to Baylor Rodman, who's following the national races tonight with an update for us. Baylor. Yes, thank you so much, Brian. So let's look at the U.S. Senate races first. Currently, Republicans in the lead with uh, 44 on their way to 51. Again, to get that majority with Democrats at 41 uh, there. Again, you need the 51, so we will continue to look at that. But I want to take a look as well now at the presidential race. If I can get my thing moving here. There we are. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right, so this is kind of where we currently stand at the moment, and I want to take you to North Carolina because that is still very contentious as well. And let's take a look now at North Carolina and its 15 electoral votes. Again, Donald Trump still in the lead here with 50.1% of the vote with 48.7. About 94% of the precincts are reporting at this hour. So again, North Carolina is supposed to be accepting ballots until uh, November, November 12th. Uh, we will uh, see how this continues to play out. Maybe this is why we haven't yet been able to call North Carolina um, as well for uh, anyone yet. But I want to take you to Arizona as well, and let's take a look, little bit look uh, over on the western side with its 11 electoral votes. So with 73% of the precincts reporting, Joe Biden definitely in the lead with 53.6% of the vote, Donald Trump 45.1%. Uh, Biden has very much outperformed in counties uh, uh, that Clinton won narrowly um, and also has flipped a few over there as well, and so that has certainly attributed to his lead. If we go now to Iowa, though, this is still really interesting, and it's six electoral votes coming in. Uh, this is kind of where polling had been going into Election Day with Biden up about three, about four in Iowa, and then that highly accredited Des Moines Register poll showed Trump actually in the lead of about seven coming into Election Day, which is how much he won the state by in 2016. I will say as the night has progressed, we have seen these numbers certainly tighten um, as we continue to have more votes in. We're about 66 percent now, so of course this is also why we have not yet called this race either. And then we're going to take a look at uh, Wisconsin as well. I know we talked a little bit about this earlier, but there's a little bit of an update here with Donald Trump now with 51.5% of the vote to Joe Biden uh, at 47. And again, we have about 60% of our precincts record, uh, reporting. So again, we're tightening in all these battleground states across the way. Again, a lot of networks have still called Florida for Donald Trump. We are still monitoring that. And as soon as I can give the official OK, I'll bring that to you. Thanks, Baylor. We're now going to turn things toward Florida. Uh, the latest there, a student at UMiami covering the election tensions on the campus there. So why 
I saw that on like campus. The center of campus has become the center of controversy. The University of Miami College Republicans uh, several months ago uh, went through the process that the student center complex has for reserving space to uh, put up banners. But students watched an all last Monday afternoon as one student painted a picture worth a thousand words. The unidentified artist has led many students to wonder how a political advertisement is allowed to be displayed on campus. A political sign uh, like they did with, that just lists out the names of the candidates, you, you know, that's, that falls within freedom of expression. And freedom of expression was exercised even further on the foot green just 24 hours before election day. The college Republicans took their initiative one step further by placing 300 Trump lawn signs on the foot green in efforts of a little something called campus Trumpification. But some students were quick to express their concerns about the Trumpification. I don't necessarily feel safe. This college is supposed to be like a safe place for everyone, regardless of your race, uh, gender, where you came from, and this is obviously not supporting that. The college Republicans had reserved space to table on the foot green Monday morning into the afternoon, but many of the attendees were not there in support of the president. Here today just to show, um, I guess, my anti-Trump support, really. A group of students formed across from the college Republicans to counter the event. Dr. Patricia Whiteley and Dean Prepke sat down with the students to have a conversation about how the university is allowing such a political statement to be made on campus. But many are still waiting for the university to make a move. I'm really expecting the university to kind of either pick a side at this point. Like, whose side are you on? If you really cared that much about diversity, you wouldn't be doing this much harm emotionally and physically to students. For UMTV, I'm Julia Hecht. As you said, at the top of this hour, Amy Gailey has won the Senate seat for North Carolina's State Senate in District 24. Now, Maeve Ashburg is going to tell us a little bit more about Gailey. Maeve? J.D. Wooten for this seat. She's a Republican and the current chair of the Alamance County Board of Alamance County Commissioners. Excuse me. But one thing, fun fact, is she will be the first woman to have ever held the seat. Now that she has been elected again, she's taking over for Rick Gunn, who stepped down this year. He had held that seat since 2011. One of her big things in the seat as a state senator now for District 24 is that she's hoping to rebuild businesses disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Businesses can go a lot of different places now, and we need to have an infrastructure in uh, Eastern Guilford and in Alamance counties that is uh, supportive to businesses being able to conduct, you know, their business in the way that they're going to profit and the whole community really blossoms and grows. And again, Gailey won by just about 52% of the vote, 50, 51, but when you're at about 52, Brian, I'm going to toss back to you now. Thank you, Maeve. We're going to head over to Baylor Rodman with an update on the national races. Baylor, what's new? Yeah, so we are really looking at Arizona and Florida. These are two that, again, a lot of networks are calling in two different ways, and we are still uh, awaiting to do so as it's getting very tight. We want to make sure that we're very accurate, and so we're waiting for numerous different sources before we report it. That being said, um, currently it looks like Joe Biden is in the lead in Arizona to take those 11 electoral votes away from Republicans and President Trump. It is a state that Trump carried four years ago, and it's a state Republicans have carried for the last 25 years. So this is certainly the electorate within Arizona has been changing drastically over the last few years. And again, uh, it looks like that Joe Biden will be able to take it away. And again, it looks like it's hopefully something that we will be able to call for you shortly. Same situation with Florida. The numbers really haven't changed against just a lot of networks have taken that initiative to go ahead and call that. I want to take you to Maine now. Um, Trump had been leading here a little bit, is now again as well. It's been very much back and forth. Um, and uh, Trump's there with about 50.9% of the vote. Numbers really haven't changed here with Joe Biden with 46.2. I will say, well, it looks like Trump has a lead. It, most likely, I would say the Foles, you know, Maine and Nebraska both work these two different ways, right? Where electorally speaking, 
Out of the four electoral votes, two of those are based off of, you know, the, the full vote of the state. So whoever, whichever candidate wins the majority of the state will get those two electoral votes. And then the other two are based on the districts. And Maine's first district tends to go pretty much always Democratic, and Maine's second district tends to sometimes go Republican and has been in the last few years. It looks like Trump will potentially be able to pick up one electoral vote here, picking up Maine's second congressional district, but then again, the other three then going to Joe Biden. Um, and I, that's what Trump did four years ago, and I, I think the campaign would consider that a win. Is again, while sure it would be nice to get those three, a, 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 those three extra, excuse me, electoral votes. As we get down to the wire here, you can see it's very, very tight, and every vote is really going to count. Um, and let's then again look at North Carolina and our 15 electoral votes here, and we're still. We're still very, very close here, which is about 58,000 votes in between the two. And it is, again, we may have to wait um, more than just tonight for this one. And then lastly, I'll just bring you to Wisconsin, where again, um, Okay, well, I won't bring you to Wisconsin, but basically, again, here, uh, the president is, has a little bit of a lead, 51.5 to 47. So these are going to be very, very tight. Brian? Thank you, Baylor. And we're following all of these White House races very closely. And we'll be back in just a few minutes with more for you. And welcome back to Elon News Network's special coverage of Election Night 2020. I'm Brian Ray, glad to be back with you. And our John Sarver has been following the North Carolina State House race. And as we told you last hour, Ricky Hurtado has won that seat for District 63. That begins right next to Elon, includes Graham and stops at the border of Mebane. Now, this is a big win for Ricky Hurtado. He was running against Republican incumbent Stephen Ross. Stephen Ross was first elected in 2012. And like I said, John Sarver has been following that race and spoke to Hurtado after his win. Here's what he had to say. Uh, the, the results came in. It, it was a tight race, but uh, you, you came out over 500 votes ahead. Can you just give me your initial reactions of when you found out that the results were in and all, all the precincts reported and you were in the lead? Yeah, I mean, we are excited about the strong results we've seen tonight uh, in Alamance County, District 63. Uh, at the end of tonight, on election night, I am up by several hundred points. But as we know, this, this race is still not over, still too close to call. We understand that there's still votes out there, and we want to make sure that this process and democracy plays out and that every vote is counted. And um, you're, you'll, you'll, if, uh, if the votes are certified, uh, you'll be the first uh, Latino uh, member to the uh, North Carolina General Assembly. Can you just give me uh, uh, your thoughts on what, what it's going to be like to, to take on that role? Yeah, I mean, as the message has been throughout my campaign, it's really been about bringing this community together. And, and I, I truly believe that it means uh, recognizing that diversity is our strength and not our weakness. And so I'm excited to provide a, a new perspective uh, in, a, in a growing electorate, a growing diverse community, and making sure that we're doing everything to represent everyone in our community. And uh, I was in there a few minutes ago when uh, the news broke and you were addressing uh, everybody at the event. And the, the message was celebratory, but it was, uh, it's not over yet. We got we to gotta, gotta go back and count these votes and make sure it's all certified. So for you, for you personally and for your campaign, what is physically the next step in just making sure that the election is certified? Yeah, I mean, we're, 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 we're certainly waiting to see to make sure that every provisional ballot and, and, and final mail-in ballots are, are counted. We know that uh, folks can still have their votes counted for a few more days here in North Carolina. And uh, we're, not, we're not celebrating or doing anything prematurely. We're making sure that everyone's voice is heard because that's the most important part for us as a campaign. Okay, and um, is there anything else that you'd like to add in regards to your campaign and just kind of, uh, what, because we talked a little bit earlier about what, what it's been like to run this campaign and now, now that you know that you have this lead uh, after election night's over, just kind of reflect on it maybe one more time for me? Yeah, I mean, I think in the vote count, you see that over 20,000 people have said that they want to see Alamance County, North Carolina, move forward in a different direction. And so I think that's a overwhelming sort of uh, voice to, to really listen to, to make sure that we are serving the needs of everyone in our community. So I'm excited to be a part of that conversation, be a part of that vision to move us all forward in North Carolina. Awesome. Thank you very much for taking the time to speak with me tonight Absolutely. and uh, uh, good luck moving forward. Thank you so much. Now going to turn things over to Baylor Rodman, who's closely following those national races. Baylor, how are things looking right now?
Ryan, good to see you again, and I should say good morning. Good morning to you. It is now officially 12 a.m. Eastern. We have moved into November the 4th, and we still are not at 270 yet. I will say a lot of things very, very, very close. Let's start with places where Trump is certainly leading right now for sure, and again, we are uh, awaiting to call these results um, most likely for Trump, and that's Florida first. With its 29 electoral votes, most likely going to go to President Trump, as again, these numbers really haven't sh uh, changed at all since we're about 98% of the precincts reporting. But again, we want to make sure that we are right. And so we're going to wait to officially call that. But again, looks like President Trump will probably take this sunshine state of Florida. Let's also move down over to uh, Texas, where this has been a state I know uh, Democrats have been trying very hard, and it seems like in the last few days uh, in the final push that Democrats had a lot of momentum in this state, and they definitely did. I mean, I don't know that we've seen numbers uh, so tight, um, especially as first early voting numbers were coming in for sure, uh, but it does look like President Trump will probably take the Lone Star State of Texas with the 52% of the vote to Joe Biden's 46.6. Again, about only those 78% of the precincts are reporting, so we're we're still waiting to call that one. Um, let's move over also to Georgia, where it looks like um, the president is ahead. Again, another place where Democrats really, really pushing uh, to try and take this state over. And again, we haven't really seen margins like this in a while. Uh, and But again, as of now, the president is in the lead there. And I'll move to Ohio lastly where it looks like the president is still in the lead to get those 18 electoral votes. No Republican has uh, won the presidency without the state of Ohio, and only two presidents have uh, lost the state of Ohio and still gone on to win the Electoral College. Last time in modern history was John F. Kennedy. Some fun trivia for you. All right, but let's move now into Arizona, where uh, certainly uh, Joe Biden is uh, outperforming um, Hillary Clinton by far and uh, Republicans for a long time as well. Uh, and again, we expect to be able to call this race for Joe Biden uh, any minute now, but again, he's up there with 74% of the precincts reporting at this hour with 53.5% of the vote to Donald Trump's 50, I'm sorry, 45.2. Also, Mark Kelly, the Democrat, is over uh, incumbent Senator Martha McSally at this point as well. Again, that would be a must need for Democrats to try and take the majority. Um, depending on how things shake out, Republicans could could lose that seat and still clench on. Um, but again, then we'd have to look to things like Maine and Susan Collins and her holding her seat. And so we'll get into that a little bit later as we start to know a little bit more of the results. But that's where they stand. We haven't been able to change any of our electoral count numbers. So we're still leading currently Joe Biden in the lead with 209 with Donald Trump's 118. But again, I'd say maybe within the next uh, hour we'd be able to tighten that. I quickly just want to go to North Carolina only to point out that the numbers in the last hour have not changed. President Trump is still in the lead with 50.1 percent of the vote to Joe Biden 48.7. So the last hour to le at the 11 o'clock hour this is where the number stood and the, the precincts reporting still 94 percent. Again what this could mean is maybe there are other um, you know, unseen absentee ballots that uh, were uh, registered, um, that were received to recipients, and maybe they haven't been mailed in yet. Again, as long as they were postmarked by today, they could be accepted by uh, November the 12th. And so this is my point of, this may be all we have for tonight. We may not get any further than this, Brian. Thank you, Baylor. And still to come tonight, a look at the U.S. Senate race where Cal Cunningham and Tom Tillis look to be neck and neck right now. Don't go anywhere. Thanks for sticking with us. What you see right now is the Trump Hotel in Washington, D.C., where he may be making an appearance tonight. You can see the police sirens right in front of that hotel there. Now we're going to turn things nationally to the U.S. Senate race here in North Carolina. Um, Republican incumbent Tom Tillis is holding a victory party right now, but the State Board of Elections is still counting votes. I have the website up right here next to me. They're still waiting to count in one precinct, but only 75 percent of the ballots cast have been counted right now. So we're gonna head on over to Maeve Ashbrook who's gonna tell us more about this Senate race, Maeve. Yeah, Brian, and one thing we really haven't touched on tonight is that this campaign for both Tillis and Cunningham was really pretty riddled with controversy. You know, I want to start with Tom Tillis. In early October, he attended that Supreme Court nomination of now Justice Amy Coney Barrett in the Rose Garden. And while he was pictured wearing a mask outside, later on he was diagnosed with the coronavirus. There have been pictures saying that he was he was not wearing a mask inside. Excuse me, one of the few wearing one outside. Uh, Tom Tillis overall says that he thinks North Carolina is in a good place as far as reopening and the COVID-19 pandemic. But he does say also that national the response has been good from President Donald Trump. In a crisis, 
you don't go for perfect. You go for good steps in the right direction. And if Cal were listening to the people in North Carolina, he would know to a person they would want him to vote yes on what I voted yes for last well, week. I and both Cal Cunningham and Tom Tillis say that they support another round of stimulus going out to the American people because of the pandemic. But to get to the controversy, as far as Cunningham, a series of text screenshots came out suggesting that he might have been in, um, engaging in an extramarital relationship. Those texts have been labeled as sexting, one saying, quote, that he was calling a woman, quote, historically sexy. So those have been labeled as sex. Again, Cal Cunningham, like I said, supports another round of stimulus and again says that North Carolina is in a good place as far as reopening. He does want to, if elected, continue widespread testing and make sure that personal protective equipment can get out to everyone. Nationally, though, he thinks that it hasn't been such a good response. We are seeing and experiencing an unprecedented failure of leadership in this country. And we have tens of thousands of Americans who have lost their lives, often without being able to be with their loved ones in their final hours. Yeah, and like and like you said, Brian, this race is still that we're still counting ballots, so it might be a little too close to call still. Um, Tillis is, though, um, claiming victory in a speech, so we'll see what happens with that. Brian, back to you. Yeah, thank you, Maeve. We're now going to head over to Isabella Seaman. She's live in our newsroom with an update on some local results for us. Isabella, what's new? Absolutely. So, Brian, let's talk about why the precincts were in so fast today. So, I was at the Board of Elections, and I know each precinct, each 38 precincts has a precinct judge. Now they just have to bring a computer chip to the Board of Elections. Once it gets to the Board of Elections, it gets put in, into a computer, which computes all of the results super quickly. Now, this has been interesting because when I was there on Super Tuesday, we were there waiting for results way later. Now this could be because of the record-breaking numbers for early voting, but also due to the coronavirus pandemic. People were socially distanced, things were trained very well. This is maybe a reason why that things ran very smoothly today, Brian. Isabella, thank you. Well, thank you for tuning in for this update. And we're still following those results for the U.S. Senate race here in North Carolina and across the country. We're right there with you waiting for these results. And once we have them, we will bring them to you. Thank you for joining us at this 1 a.m. hour. We begin tonight with Baylor Rodman, who's been following that national race all night long. Baylor, what's new since the last time we were here? Thank you so much, Brian. Yeah, um, so let's take a quick look first at the U.S. Senate race, uh, and then you can come back to me uh, for a few presidential calls that we have to make. Uh, but first, you know, 51 is the majority needed for the Republicans, and right now, uh, Republicans seem to be in a pretty okay water to be able to hit, uh, retain that majority, but again, things have been changing uh, pretty closely for sure. This is the map as it stands now. Those blacked out ones are, of course, uh, there are no races happening at that time, but just to give you a little bit of a leeway over here in Montana, uh, the Republican um, Steve Danes is over Steve Bullock, uh, and the, he was an incumbent there, so it looks like he will hold on to his seat. Uh, Republicans may lose Arizona for Martha McSally to, um, to Mark Kelly. Uh, New Mexico is... Uh, probably headed the Democratic way as well, but it looks like Republicans will be able to hold in Georgia, in Indiana, uh, in Susan Collins in Maine, kind of a, a definitely a surpriser in terms of polling, just how close that is still is. Looks like she may be, be able to hold on to that seat, and it looks like Democrats will be able to hold on Minnesota, uh, and, uh, of course, then the final tour comes down is Michigan. John James, uh, the GOP's had a lot of faith in, the, in this race, and it turns out that he's doing a, a, a lot better than I think anyone anticipated at this point in time. And it looks like... Um, Senator Perdue, the Republican incumbent, will hold on to his seat there. So again, we could probably see that Senate, uh, Senate majority uh, staying with the Republicans, but it also sort of depends on, uh, I think, presidential, presidentially speaking, how some of these states go. But um, I'm going to toss it back to you really quickly, and uh, you can come back to me soon because I certainly have a few projections to share with you on the presidential level. Great. Thank you, Baylor. We will definitely be back with you soon. But now we're going to turn to Nikki Walker, who's live in Los Angeles. She's a reporter over at the University of Southern California. Thanks so much for joining us tonight, Nikki. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So what sorts of things have you been following tonight? Yeah, we're obviously following all of the battleground states as you are over um, at your news network, network as well. Um, but in addition to that, we're following the Gen Z vote pretty highly, um, talking with our students. Um, and USC is a virtual university right now. None of our classes are in person for the majority of our undergrad students. So our students are truly all over the country right now um, and really following the issues that our generation of students are, follow, are, are caring about. 
Yeah, great. And so, you know, for the students who are still on campus, what's kind of the campus climate like right now? I know over here at Elon, we're definitely going to be watching that over the next few days as the results still come mm -hmm. in. So we don't have any students on campus. Um, we have uh, a very few amount um, living around the university um, in off campus housing. But in terms of in person classes, um, they're not necessarily existing. It's only for our medical students right now. So we're really monitoring that online space, um, looking at different community groups, um, different organizations, and, and reaching out to students. Right now, our university is holding election stress workshops. Our student health has been holding those um, twice a week. So we are looking at those um, and kind of gauging what students are caring about. And then we also had a town hall this morning um, put on by USC students to gather together. Normally, you'll see behind me, this is our Annenberg Forum. This is normally packed with students in 2016, um, all four Four levels were packed with students, just really um, there for each other, caring about what's happening. And um, we obviously don't have that right now. So turning to those virtual spaces. Yeah, great. And do you think having students all remote this semester had any effect on the election or maybe their turnout in the election? Turnout, I think that mostly um, USC students are very engaged, um, given that we have a lot of um, media courses here. I think that whether you are in Annenberg, which is our communication journalism school, or you are in any of the other um, the sub colleges of USC, I do think that the students are politically engaged, um, whether they be going to um, different speaks that YIF puts on or college Dems. Um, I think that the students here are very politically engaged, um, both on campus and again online. Yeah, and you know, California usually tends to fall blue um, in elections, but have you guys been seeing anything different tonight out of California? California um, is projected right now to be blue. It hasn't gone um, red since um, the 1990s. So um, I don't believe that right now we are seeing anything too differently. Of course, like every other area, there are counties that are different and have a different political climate. So that's something to watch. Um, it's not to say that students at USC in California and Los Angeles do not have differing political beliefs, and we are following that as well. But um, in terms of the projection, California um, overall, we're seeing um, stay blue. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Nikki, for joining us. We appreciate your insight all the way from the West Coast in Los Angeles. Yes, thank you so much. Thanks. And shortly before we came on air tonight, former Vice President Joe Biden spoke to his supporters, and he said the election is not over till every vote is counted. And shortly after that, President Trump tweeted that he will also be speaking tonight. So now we're going to turn back to Baylor Rodman with some more about that. Baylor? Your patience is commendable. We knew this was going to go long, but who knew we're going to go into maybe tomorrow morning, maybe even longer. But look, we feel good about where we are. We really do. I'm here to tell you tonight, we believe we're on track to win this election. We knew because of the unprecedented early vote and the mail-in vote, it's going to take a while. We're going to have to be patient until we, uh, the hard work of tallying the votes is finished. And it ain't over till every vote is counted, every ballot is counted. And a race that ENN was able to call was the race for governor right here in North Carolina, and that is going to incumbent Governor Roy Cooper. Here's a quick clip from his victory speech earlier tonight. North Carolinians have made their voices heard tonight, but the hard work of listening to all voices will be ongoing. So let's take the time to imagine what it's like to be in each other's shoes. Let's dedicate ourselves to really hearing one another. Let's take the time to see what is really true, what is not, and what is worthy of debate. Today and for the next four years, I will work hard to be the governor of every single North Carolinian. Thank you for your continued trust in me. May God bless all of you. May God bless our country. And may God bless the great state of North Carolina. Thank you all very much. 
And we're now going to turn to Baylor Rodman with what all of this means for the national races. Baylor? Yes, <laughs> hi there. I was just updating because we got so much going on. Uh, but there is a lot to recall right now. So let's get right to it. And I want to start with the latest, which is the Lone Star State of Texas. We are now able to project, and I will soon put the big graphic right here that says winner, winner. Uh, but I'm able to project to you that Donald Trump, uh, the president, will hold on to the Lone Star State of Texas with 52.2% of the vote opposed to Joe Biden with 46.4% of the vote. And again, we have about 80% of our precincts reporting at this point. So again, Elon News Network can confirm that uh, President Trump will carry the state of Texas. All right, let's move on also to the sunshine state of Florida, where we can project that President Trump will carry the sunshine state of Florida and all 29 of its electoral votes with 51.3% of the vote as opposed to Joe Biden's 47.8%. And that is still with 98% of pretty much all of our precincts reporting. So again, we can project that Donald Trump will also win the sunshine state of Florida. We can also project that President Trump will carry the state of Iowa and its six electoral votes with 53.4% as opposed to Biden's 45.2 with again about 99% reporting at this hour. We can also project that President Trump will win the state of Ohio in its 18 electoral votes with 53.5% uh, of the vote as opposed to Joe Biden's 45.1%. And then we can project that uh, the Former Vice President Joe Biden and Democratic nominee will carry Minnesota and all 10 of its electoral votes with 52.7% of the vote as opposed to Trump's 43.5. So we can again project with 77% of our precincts reporting that Joe Biden will win the state of Minnesota. Uh, we also projected earlier, but in case you missed it, there was a lot going on last hour that Joe Biden carried the state of New Hampshire and its four electoral votes with 53.3% as opposed to Trump's 449 That's pretty much on par with where polling was coming into election night. I want to quickly look to Maine now. We uh, have not yet been able to uh, declare a winner there. Oh, well, this is 2016, but uh, as you can see, Maine in 2016, as was New Hampshire, um, Again, all went blue then, and uh, all those states that Trump won, and of course Biden with Minnesota went blue at that point too. But if I can pull up, here we go, let's try it one more time, Mi uh, Maine. This brings me to 2016. All right, well, my point here was that Maine is still contested at this point, and let me bring you to Georgia. I know I can click on that one. There we go, and it's 16 electoral votes. At this point, this, cr this race, like Maine, is still too close to call. We are not able to confirm uh, or project, rather, who will carry this state. But right now we have Donald Trump in the lead with 53.1% of the vote, as opposed to Joe Biden's 456 with about 83% of our precincts reporting. And um, again, we began with Texas, where we said that the president was able to win that state. But let's go back to the Tar Heel, North Carolina, and it's 15 electoral votes. We've said it all night in all of our pre-shows, in, in all the material you've heard, it could be North Carolina's 15 electoral votes that determine who gets over the 270 top, and boy, oh boy, could that really be true. Currently, the numbers have not changed in the last two hours. Uh, Donald Trump's up 50.1% to Joe Biden's 48.7. Uh, Tom Tillerson a slight lead there, but as you know, Governor Roy Cooper was reelected as well. So again, these numbers haven't changed, which indicates that, you know, it could be waiting on absentee voting that um, recipients received, but maybe did not yet return. Again, as long as they were postmarked by today, they can be counted in the state uh, until November 12th, uh, currently as it stands. So, of course, we'll see how that all plays out. Uh, and we will see if that really makes a difference one way or the other, or if this is kind of the direction we're heading in, in terms of North Carolina. So it's a whole lot of information at once, but again, the magic number of 270, not yet met. Uh, Biden at 223 with Donald Trump at 212. Still anybody's game. Brian? Thank you, Baylor. And don't go anywhere. We still have more election updates for you next. Following months of civil unrest and protests in the country, race relations, it plays a role in this election with both presidential candidates being asked about it in the two debates. Some members of the black community at Elon told ENN that there's a lot at stake this election. Alicia Powell says she didn't want to leave her apartment on election day for fears of her safety as a black woman. I've been harassed like three times last month, uh, one on campus, one two, twice off campus. Um, 
I see Trump flags driving around. I see people with guns sometimes. It's very scary. Powell says this election is about more than picking candidates. We're fighting for our country, like democracy completely. When was America great? You know, I feel like I've never gotten a full ant, like we've never gotten the full win. Is that when slavery was happening? Is that when white people were supreme? Kennedy Boston has been attending Black Lives Matter protests in the community, trying to make her voice heard. This is more than just who's going to be president. This is how will I continue to live my life in this country? Or how quickly should I be getting out of this country in order to continue to live my life as I have previously? Um, and that's a really terrifying thing to think about. Political science professor Damian Blake says this election cycle is unlike any other he's seen. In the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, Blake says people of color are facing two pandemics. There's also the pandemic on race and social justice. And so I think the, the results of the elections will further um, deepen and intensify the frayed race relations uh, in the, you know, Alamance and Burlington area. Powell says she hopes whoever inherits the presidency can create change for black Americans. I think they all try. I think they're politicians at the end of the day. Of the day so that means lies. That means empty promises sometimes because they have all high hopes. That's According to the North Carolina Board of Elections, about 20 percent of voters here in North Carolina are black. And according to data from Tufts University, North Carolina has seen a 9% increase in voter registration in people ages 18 to 24. Director of the Elon Poll, Jason Husser, says youth voters tend to turn out in higher numbers when elections seem competitive and high stakes, like this 2020 election. And uh, tends to go pretty solidly blue every year, so I knew that North Carolina was um, a more important state to cast my vote in, like my vote would count more here. Who you just heard from that is Tommy Truitt. He switched his voter registration from Maryland to North Carolina. Here at Elon University, only 44% of eligible students voted in the 2016 election. According to Elon Votes, a nonpartisan initiative to help students navigate voting, they've seen an increase in students registering to vote, with many asking how to change their registration to North, North Carolina. Like Truitt, they expect to have full data on student voter turnout come March 2021. And that is all for our update this hour. Stay tuned as we continue to follow those election results coming in for election night 2020. It is now 2 a.m. on November 4th, and we are still here following the results of the 2020 election. I'm Brian Ray. Thanks for sticking with us tonight. We're going to head right over to Baylor Rodman, who's been following the presidential race for us tonight. Baylor, what's new since the last time we were on air about an hour ago? Well, thank you so much, Brian. Yeah, um, there are certainly a few things we want to look at for sure. Currently, as the, the electoral map looks as it does in this 2 a.m. hour, um, we haven't been able to project anything different uh, than we were just an hour ago. But that being said, the numbers are certainly tightening in some of those places. So let's kind of walk through some of those that especially we're still waiting on. So let's look at Georgia right now and its 16 electoral votes. Donald Trump still with a uh, slight margin there on top, but it, it has gotten certainly tighter and tighter as the hours have gone on with Trump uh, ahead 50.7% to Joe Biden, 48.1% with about 83% of our precincts reporting. Let's also now go, now go to Nevada. Uh, this is something that the Trump campaign had been really trying to, uh, uh, they spent a lot of money in this state, they've been really trying to gain momentum as well, and the margin there is getting tighter, uh, tighter as well with Nevada's six electoral votes. Again, uh, the Trump campaign's done pretty well with Hispanic and Cuban Americans and Latino voters in general uh, over the one from what they did in 2016 so far. And so we, we did anticipate this to get a little bit tighter as well. But currently Biden in the lead with 50.3 to uh, Trump's 47.6% of the uh, vote with about 67% of our precincts reporting. And let's go to Arizona. We have not been able to call Arizona yet. That being said, it is certainly leaning Democrat with Joe Biden up 52.4 to Trump's 46.3 with again about 77% of our precincts uh, reporting. So we do anticipate this will probably go Biden's way. But again, we have not been able to call and confirm that yet. 
Uh, but let's now move up to kind of the, uh, the Rust Belt here uh, and into the blue walls that was historically called uh, up until about four years ago with Wisconsin. Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, this played a huge role in getting Trump to the White House the first time just four years ago, and it could certainly play a role yet again. So here is President Trump up a little bit with 88% of our precincts reporting at this hour in Wisconsin with its 10 ele electoral votes. Again, he's up about 50, right there, 51.2 to Joe Biden's 47.3. And let's go to Michigan as well. Michigan, the president is up in this state too, with its 16 electoral votes up at stake, with Trump up with 53.7% to Biden's 44.7, with again about 65% of our precincts reporting. And uh, we'll take a look now at Pennsylvania with its 20 electoral votes, and this may be a little while, but the president with just 64 though, just 64% of our precincts reporting, the president is up pretty substantially there with 56.6% of the vote to Biden's 42.2. Uh, another thing we certainly wanna take a look at, um, Maine, uh, we'll probably be able to, to call this relatively soon. I will say uh, Maine as, as, as a whole, the state is leaning certainly Democrat, uh, but it looks like uh, Donald Trump will be able to hold on to Maine's second congressional district. As you know, Maine and Nebraska do things a little bit differently. Um, Biden was actually able to grab on to Nebraska, Nebraska's second congressional district, giving him that extra one point boost there. Uh, we anticipate Trump to be able to do the same here in Maine. Again, but Biden will probably win three out of those four electoral votes. And then as we end the night uh, here in our 2 a.m. hour, I bring you back to North Carolina with the 15 electoral votes. It truly could be what makes the difference from one to the other. The numbers haven't changed in a few hours. Trump just slightly ahead with 50.1% over Joe Biden, 48.7%. Time will tell. Votes are still being counted, I guess. But again, we've had we, we've had no update for the last uh, at least two hours thus far in the Tar Heel. Brian, 2 a.m. Back to you. Uh, 2 a.m. for sure. Thank you, Baylor. We will check back in with you soon. But for now, we're going to turn it over to Maeve Ashbrook with a quick recap of those local races we've been following tonight. And ENN was able to call all those local races. So, Maeve, what should we know coming out of tonight? You know, at the beginning of the night, we're giving the overview of these races and the candidates. And now we're giving the overview of those races and their winners. First of all, again, those Alamance County Commissioners, the six candidates, three winners. And these are all three of the Republican candidates at the night. We started with three Republicans, three Democrats. And here are our winners, all Republicans, John Paisley Jr., Pamela Thompson, and Bill Lashley. Now moving on to one of the tightest races of the night, North Carolina House of, Rep of, of Representatives District 63. Ricky Hurtado took that seat, beating incumbent Stephen Ross, 50%, 49% Ross. Really one of the tighter ones we've seen tonight. Also another North Carolina House District 64. Dennis Riddell, Republican incumbent, took that seat with 59% of the vote. For, so a little bit more of a substantial win there. As far as the North Carolina State Senate, District 24, Amy Gailey, who is is currently the chair of the Alamance County Commissioners, won that seat after Rick Gunn stepped down. He's held that since 2011, and she's the first woman to have held that seat in the history of the state. Um, we also were able to call the North Carolina governor's race. Incumbent Democratic Governor Roy Cooper gets to hold his spot as the 75th governor. Moving a little bit more nationally, the United States House of Representatives, so not North Carolina, District 13, Ted Budd. He it was the incumbent. However, this is the first year Alamance County is in District 13. Originally, we were in the 6th District. So even though he is a third-term representative now, he... He is only our first term here with us in Alamance County. Now there is one more race we have yet to call Tom Tillis versus Cal Cunningham. Really haven't heard much since the last time we updated on this one. Um, that's, that's really all I have for you there. We will continue to follow this, of course, on our website all the time, elonnewsnetwork.com. All right, that's my wrap up of the local races, Brian. That's, that's what I got for you. Back to you. Thank you, Maeve, and thank you for keeping us updated throughout the night. And you ended there on the U.S. Senate race. We're going to go ahead and turn back to Baylor Rodman with an update on the Senate races across the country that we should be following. Baylor, any update on those races? Yes, I absolutely do. So we were able to call... Um, oh, God, excuse me. We were able to call Montana uh, for Steve Daines over Steve Bullock. Uh, so that was a big win for Republicans for sure. That was a seat they really needed to hold on to. Currently, again, you need that 51 for the majority. Um 
or honestly at least 50 and then winning the presidency is of course the vice president serves as the president of the Senate. That could be something that we do see turn out where you know the Senate majority could come down to who wins the presidency at the same time. That being said, Republicans are certainly um, in a pretty good position thus far. Again, with Steve Daines pulling it off in Montana, uh, looks like uh, S -S Senator Perdue of uh, Georgia will probably take it off. Tom Tillis is still in the lead here in North Carolina, and Susan Collins is actually doing pretty well in Maine, uh, again, which was a little bit of a surprise coming in, uh, in, in polling. She had certainly been behind for uh, the first time, really, since her, her first run in 97. So. Um, Again, if that's the case, 47, Susan Collins, 48, Tom Tillis, 49, and uh, Purdue would be 50 with, again, of course, uh, whoever, uh, if President Trump does get reelected, Vice President Pence serving as the president of the Senate, giving them that 51. That being said, John James in his race uh, in um, Michigan, so he's the Republican there, uh, really had no shot. He ran for uh, it in 2018, and it was not one that Democrats really had their eyes on as one that they a seat that they could potentially lose. But the RNC sent a lot of delegates in. They sent a, a lot of money into that race to really give that the final push. Um, anticipating as it could all come down to Michigan for their Senate majority potentially. Um, so again, we, we're seeing him doing pretty well there. But again, there's still a lot of the vote overall that we're still waiting on. Arizona incumbent Senator uh, Martha McSally for the Republicans looks like she's not going to pull it off tonight with Democrat uh, Mark Kelly. He certainly has a lead right now as well. And Democrats have that lead in um, in uh, New Mexico as well, but of course Alaska will probably go uh, the Republicans way as it traditionally does. Polling, um, all the polls just closed in Alaska, so we'll get more information on the Senate and of course the uh, presidential race in just a little bit. Again, that traditionally goes Republican and based on current trends we're already seeing, uh, it does look like it's going to go that way tonight. So looks like Republicans certainly have a shot at holding the majority, but again, <laughs> comes down to North Carolina. We'll see about Tom Tillis uh, and if, if, if Donald Trump can pull it off here or if it will switch back to the Republican side for the first time, um, full frontal since 2008. Brian? Sure, Baylor, thank you. We're now going to turn it over to ENN's news director, Jack Norcross. He's with our team in the newsroom where they've been working hard all night. He's going to give us a little look into what they've been doing. Jack? Hey, Brian, thank you so much. I'm sitting here with actually Executive Director uh, Mackenzie Wilkes. Mackenzie, you've been following us so many of the races tonight. Uh, some shocking races, uh, including uh, for NC-63, but there's some other races, too, which were surprises for Republicans, especially for Alamance County Commissioner. Yeah, so with Alamance County Commissioner, the county commissioner precinct uh, got to the majority in the county commissioner with uh, John Paisley, Brad Ashley, and Pamela Thompson all taking those three spots on the board. And so with that, uh, those three spots, Amy Bailey also won the uh, Senate 24th race. And so Amy Bailey, she's currently the chair of county commissioners, but with her taking that Senate seat, she is now going to um, be moving on to the Senate, and then there, there's an open spot in the county commissioner. So those three Democrats that did not end up getting a seat, this is like, will they seek uh, for, for the term for, for the special election. Right, right. And then we see some of the candidates, including Bob Byrd, uh, Kristen Powers, Dream Caldwell, the Democrats who ran in the Alamance County Commissioner's mm -hmm. race. It'll be interesting to see if they will run in this special election that we expect uh, to be held. Uh, one thing we're also monitoring right now, and I'm sure the control room has, is we're monitoring uh, President Trump is expected to make some remarks uh, from the East Room of the White House. Uh, you're looking at live pictures right now. Uh, from that event, we heard from Joe Biden, the vice president, former vice president and Democratic nominee early in the night. And we're expecting Donald Trump uh, to make some remarks, too. But really, this is really coming down to just a handful of states, Mackenzie, including North Carolina, where uh, the Associated Press, who we are basing our projections off of, has yet to make a call. And every other major outlet has yet to make a call uh, for the U.S. Senate race between Cal Cunningham and Tom Tillis. And we're going to go, uh, we're going to, we're getting some new information. We're seeing some people uh, walk into the East Room now as they are coming in. And they are, we are expecting, again, President Donald Trump to make a statement from the East Room of the White House where we will hear him discuss kind of how he will move forward here and what he will do in these coming days as we expect uh, uh, him to, to really kind of say, you know, we need to wait until this really unfolds in order we can really uh, make a projection. We see some of his staff just kind of walking in there. I don't know if we can take it back again. We saw his staff kind of entering in 
uh, uh, first and waiting uh, to hear him make a statement. What do you think Donald Trump needs to say tonight, Mackenzie, in order to really uh, bring the nation together and really move forward, given that we really aren't going to have a clear winner tonight? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I, I think no matter what, what the results are, we can't call those yet. But um, he, he's really going to need to speak to the nation to reassure them that um, what's next, what's, what are we doing moving forward? Yes, yep, yep, that's right. And uh, we're, we're, we're once again monitoring the White House. If we can take that, that image again, uh, Donald Trump is expected uh, to speak there. We, we took Joe Biden's remarks. We had to hear uh, what he had to say. What, what, what do you think this looks like moving forward? I mean, we, we, I, I think back to, uh, we, you know, thinking back to 2016, it was right around this time that President Donald Trump himself uh, you know, was announced the, the winner of the presidency after Pennsylvania was called uh, and put in his column. How do you think the, the nation moves forward? Do we see kind of a rise in tension, a, a divisiveness of sorts, do you think? Uh, well, we're seeing divisiveness right here in Alamance County. And um, Graham, there's been a lot of activity at the Confederate Monument with different groups, um, like neo-Confederate groups and different counter-protesters clashing. So we're seeing it at the local level as well as the national level across the country. And so it's a matter of trying to to bring people together and bridge some of those um, divisiveness. Br bridge that divisiveness too. And uh, once again, as we take the shot again of the East Room of the White House, where we are expecting uh, Donald Trump uh, to make a statement. Obviously, this is a very atypical uh, election season. We speak about that a lot. Uh, you know, we see uh, Joe Biden gave a speech in uh, like a drive through speech almost with cars kind of lining up. And now we see uh, President Trump here delivering an address from the East Room, uh, something else that is, that is rare as well. I want to now turn over to our Baylor Rodman, who's standing by and has some more information uh, with us. Baylor. Yeah, thanks, Jack. As you were just talking about that, you know, four years ago, it was at this point where we could call Pennsylvania for the president. And again, at this point, I just want to remind viewers that with just 20, uh, with those 20 uh, electoral votes at stake, that can make a huge, uh, this could potentially, so it could all come down to Pennsylvania is the, is the main point. But again, only 64% of our precincts are reporting with 56.6% of the vote for Trump and 42.2% for Biden. But let's really take a look at this historical background too, in the sense of how all these states kind of gone uh, four years ago. So when we look at 2016, for example, it was this Pennsylvania that we were able to call at 2 o'clock in the morning, as you were referencing to, that, that was put Trump over the top after he had taken Wisconsin as well. Again, currently leading in both these, in all three of these states right now. But again, we're still waiting for a big portion of uh, vote to come in. And so, of course, uh, you know, we're not making any significant calls now. But again, um, th this, is his, this, is, this remains his pathway. The electorate remains to be uh, very similar in the terms of how he gets to 270. As you move back to 2012, during the Obama era, right, you see uh, a lot more blue come out, and it, it was these states that Democrats really relied on to, to bring him there, to bring Obama there the second time with uh, Iowa and uh, Ohio as well that, that put uh, Obama over. And of course, North Carolina, though, was one that went over to Mitt Romney after Trump had taken that, uh, after, excuse me, Obama had taken that in 2008 for his first bid uh, 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 of the major party nominee uh, as president. And um, so again, uh, we, we've seen some his, we've seen some shifts tonight, right? In the sense of Arizona, that electorate has become uh, much more left leaning for sure in the last uh, few years, uh, and so that has been um, again we're, we're seeing some change with the electorate. I, I think Georgia has been a lot closer than it's been before. Texas has been a little bit closer than it has before, but again, nothing major, substantial to change one way or the other. But again, I mean, it was uh, I, this seems a little bit like deja vu, right? It has really, really come down to this Rust Belt here to the the, um, you know, to the upper Midwest in terms of Wisconsin, Michigan, and again, Pennsylvania could all come down to that. And of course, right here in North Carolina, of course, North Carolina is leaning Trump's way right now. But of course, we're not able to make a prediction on that. But uh, Brian, so I'll, I'll give it to you. I mean, you've seen the historical trends here. Uh, it's certainly going to be a long night as we wait for the president to see how he addresses the nation, because this is what's interesting, right? The way our election is, you, the, who, no matter who wins or what happens, whenever we do find out, uh, President Trump remains president until January 20th at noon. And so we still have to kind of continue on um, as a nation here. Uh, thoughts? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I definitely think we will be 
waiting for a while, you know, to yeah. count these. I am actually following on Twitter. CBS News just said they will not be calling the race tonight, um, which is pretty interesting. So I'm wondering if some other outlets will follow in that fashion as well. Wow. Yeah, it's been quite a night for sure, and uh, we have more results. Again, we're, we're continuously looking at Nevada. We're looking at Maine to potentially make a call there in Arizona. Again, at this point, uh, the uh, Maine, Arizona, and Nevada all sort of leaning Biden's way, but those alone don't put him over the top. And so I agree with you. I don't, I don't and with CBS News, I guess, I don't know that we would be able to make a prediction tonight. Well, thank you for your analysis, Baylor. Sure. And I'll be right back in just a minute. Some Elon students spent their election day, which they had the day off of class, working at the polls. Elon senior Megan Knorr spent 13 hours at Elon Elementary School greeting and directing voters. Knorr says she wanted to be a poll worker because she heard a need for younger people to step up. So kind of a combination of like helping keep elderly folks safe while also like keeping elections running smoothly, but also like the pay is nice. <laughs> While there, Noor helped disabled voters cast their ballots so they didn't have to leave their cars. She says she asked to be a curbside greeter because of COVID-19 concerns and greeters are stationed outside. Everyone's been really safe about masks and everything so far. Like, I think I would have been safe being inside as well, but I wanted to be extra sure. Noor says there were only a few curbside voters now yesterday, she says after her shift, she attended a watch party. We're going to check back in with Jack Norcross in the newsroom as we await President Trump to speak. Jack, what's new? All right, we're just about, we are about just a few minutes away now from President Trump coming out uh, from the White House. Let's take a look at the live pictures we're seeing uh, from the East Room of the White House. This is an area that is very non-traditional. You can see members of the first family walking in. You see Trump, uh, Tiffany. Trump, uh, Ivanka Trump, the, the, the president's uh, sibl uh, children, rather, excuse me, and we see them in the East Room of the White House. Now, this is not a traditional setting uh, for an election uh, victory, but we have President Trump, and he's going to be joined, we're told, by Melania Trump, uh, Karen Pence, and Vice President Mike Pence, and they are just about to enter, enter the East Room now. Now, obviously, these are highly anticipated remarks by the president as we see him entering uh, now. And he is going to talk about, hopefully, about kind of uh, uniting the country and moving forward, given that we do not know the results of this election. Let's take a listen in to President Donald Trump. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please sit. Thank you. This is, without question, the latest news conference I've ever had. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I appreciate it very much. And I want to thank the American people for their tremendous support. Millions and millions of people voted for us tonight. And uh, a very sad group of people is trying to disenfranchise that group of people. And we won't stand for it. We will not stand for it. I want to thank the First Lady, my entire family, and Vice President Pence, Mrs. Pence, for being with us all through this. And we were getting ready for a big celebration. We, we were winning everything, and all of a sudden it was just called off. The results tonight have been phenomenal, and we are getting ready. I mean, literally, we were just all set to get outside and just celebrate something that was so beautiful, so good, uh, such a vote, such a success. The citizens of this country have come out in record numbers. This is a record. There's never been anything like it. To support our incredible movement, we won states that we weren't expected to win. Florida, we didn't win it. We won it by a lot. And <laughs> We won the great state of Ohio. We won Texas. We won Texas. We won Texas by 700,000 votes, and they don't even include it in the tabulations. It's also clear that we have won Georgia. 
We're up by 2.5 percent, or 117,000 votes with only 7 percent left. They're never going to catch us. They can't catch us. Likewise, we've clearly won North Carolina, where we're up 1.4 percent, or 77,000 votes with only approximately 5 percent left. They can't catch us. We also, uh, if you look and you see uh, Arizona, we have a lot of life in that. And somebody said, somebody declared that it was a victory for, and maybe it will be. I mean, that's possible. But certainly there were a lot of votes out there that we could get because we're now just coming into what they call Trump territory. I don't know what you call it, but these were friendly Trump voters. And that could be overturned. The gentleman that called it, I watched tonight. He said, well, we think it's fairly unlikely that he could catch. Well, fairly unlikely. <laughs> and we don't even need it. We don't need that. That was just a state that if we would have gotten it, it would have been nice, Arizona. But there's a possibility, maybe even a good possibility. In fact, since I saw that originally, it's been changed, and the numbers have substantially come down just in a small amount of votes. So we want that, obviously, to stay in play. But most importantly, we're winning Pennsylvania by a tremendous yeah. amount of votes. We're, We're up 600. Think of this. Think of this. Think of this. We're up 690,000 votes in Pennsylvania. 690,000. These aren't even close. It's not like, oh, it's close. With 64% of the vote in, it's going to be almost impossible to catch. And we're coming into good Pennsylvania areas where they happen to like your president. I mean, it's, it's so we'll probably expand that. Uh, we're winning Michigan, but I'll tell you, I looked at the numbers. I said, whoa. I looked, I said, wow, that's a lot. By almost 300,000 votes. And 65% of the vote is in. And we're winning Wisconsin. And I said, we're winning. We don't need all of them. We need, because when you add Texas in, which wasn't added, I spoke with the really wonderful governor of Texas just a little while ago, and Greg Abbott, he said, uh, congratulations. He called me to congratulate me on winning Texas. I mean, we won Texas. I don't think they finished quite the tabulation, but there's no way. And uh, it was almost complete, but he congratulated me. Then he said, by the way, what's going on? I've never seen anything like this. Can I tell you what? Nobody has. So we won by 107,000 votes with 81% of the vote. That's Michigan. So when you take those three states in particular, and you take all of the others, I mean, we have, we have so many. We had such a big night. You just take a look at all of these states that we've won tonight. And then you take a look at the kind of margins that we've won them by. And, and all of a sudden, it's not like we're up 12 votes and we have 60 percent left. We won states, and all of a sudden, I said, what happened to the election? It's off. And we have all these announcers saying, what happened? And then they said, oh, because you know what happened? They knew they couldn't win, so they said, let's go to court. And did I predict this, Newt? Did I say this? I've been saying this from the day I heard they were going to send out tens of millions of ballots. I said exactly because either they were going to win or if they didn't win, they'll take us to court. So Florida was a tremendous victory, 377,000. Texas, as we said. Ohio, think of this. Ohio, a tremendous state, a big state. I love Ohio. We won by 8.1 percent, 461,000. Think of it. Almost 500,000 votes. North Carolina, big victory with North Carolina. And so we won there. We lead by 
76,000 votes with almost nothing left. And all of a sudden, everything just stopped. This is a fraud on the American public. This is an embarrassment to our country. We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. We did win this election. So our goal now is to ensure the integrity for the good of this nation. This is a very big moment. This is a major fraud in our nation. We want the law to be used in a proper manner. So we'll be going to the U.S. Supreme Court. We want all voting to stop. We don't want them to find any ballots at 4 o'clock in the morning and add them to the list, okay? It's, it's a very sad, it's a very sad moment. To me, this is a very sad moment. And we will win this. And we, as far as I'm concerned, we already have won. So I just want to thank you. And I want to thank all of our support. I want to thank all of the people that worked with us. And uh, Mr. Vice President, say a few words, please. Please. Okay, and uh, you just heard the uh, President Donald Trump uh, speaking there from the East Room of the White House. He made some claims that Elon News Network has not confirmed, including the fact that he won the state of North Carolina and several other states that at this point are still uh, too close and too early to call. The President uh, made several claims about uh, voter disenfranchisement, and uh, we just, uh, that is just not verified information at this point. This election still has a long way to go before we find out who the true winner is. And Elon News Network will continue to cover the race until the very last vote is counted. Brian, I'll send it back to you over in the studio And what has been a long night. And it looks like this election is going to get even longer into this week. Yes, and like you said, Jack, ENN will keep reporting on this election until every single vote is counted. Now, turning to the race for the U.S. Senate here in North Carolina, incumbent Republican Tom Tillis claimed victory earlier, but you know, those results have not been confirmed in the state yet. So here's what he had to say in his speech earlier tonight. What we accomplished tonight was a stunning victory. And we did it. We did it against all the odds, right? I mean, have we heard this before? You're down in the polls. There's no chance of winning. And I believed in every single one of you. Every single one of you did. If you think about the margin of victory tonight, doing our part to save the Senate, it happened because of the individual effort of thousands of people in North Carolina knocking on doors, making phone calls, getting the message out, letting everybody know that the truth still does matter. And again, that race has not yet been confirmed by the State Board of Elections. That'll do it for our update this morning at 2 a.m. Thank you so much for staying with us tonight. For all the election 2020 coverage, we will keep updating our website, elonnewsnetwork.com, and make sure you follow along at Elon News Network. Thank you, and have a great night and morning. <laughs>